Courtney Cox stopped by to tell us all about her new spooky series, and later we're throwing it back to an absolute classic, My Cousin Vinny. But first, here's today's pop star. I start with the item we teased earlier this morning. Larry David, HBO's pulled the comedian's highly anticipated documentary just hours before it was scheduled to premiere on Tuesday. The network announcing in a statement on Twitter that the two-part special is being postponed without giving the fans any real update as to what they, when or why or what's going on. The tweet went on to explain, quote, Larry has decided he wants to do it in front of an audience. Oh. The project titled The Larry David Story was scheduled to air last night. Oh. So I guess at face value, he wants to do it in front of an audience. Maybe okay. behind the scenes, he doesn't love the documentary. Okay. Either way, you got a lot of power at HBO to be able to <laughs> yeah, play exactly. in exactly. the 11th hour. <laughs> Next up, People, the magazine, just revealing the stars honored in this week's special Women Changing the World issue. On the cover, one of our favorite artists around here, Lizzo. Lizzo. A Grammy winner opening up to the magazine about dealing with body shamers and protecting her mental health. And in addition to the Truth Hurts singer, you're going to see some other great women in being recognized in the issue, including Rita Moreno, Goldie yeah. Hawn, and Jeopardy star Amy Schneider for the full story. Be sure and check out that new issue of People it hits newsstands on oh. Friday. Next up, Earning It, narrated by chart-topping artist Ciara. The five-part docu-series is shining a light on some of the trailblazing women working in the NFL and opening doors for more to join both on and off the field. Here's a quick peek. The pipeline for women in the NFL wasn't built overnight. It is still a work in progress. But those leading the way have built a foundation. One that leads from the stands to the sideline. And for a chosen few, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. All five episodes of Earning It, the NFL's forward progress, are streaming now on Peacock. Next up, the courtship photo, your favorite new Dying. show. Love is in the air Dying. on NBC's new dating show. That's <laughs> oh. making all of your Bridgerton dreams a reality. The new series is taking one woman back in time to Regency era England, where she's going to awesome. be courted by 16 eligible suitors. And here's a peek at Miss Nicole Remy meeting them for the first time. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being a part of this with me. I'm just so grateful. I just want you guys to know like I am in pursuit of something that I feel like I need in my life. Like I'm confident with everything else and love is one thing that's missing. So I'm 100% all in. Is it real? That costume budget looks like it's more than our annual <laughs> budget here. It just looks cinematic, doesn't it? It's like I stepping like into it. a fairy tale. Yeah. It is a good idea you go for to a ball, that era. You ride in a sure carriage. The is it like The Bridgerton oh, yeah. meets The Bachelor? But these yeah. shows are known it's to get so cool. raunchy in the hot tub. It's going to be weird to see how that all works into this it's a civilized that, society. That the right. Courtship <laughs> is the name of it. It kicks off Sunday here on NBC. You can also oh. stream it the following day on Peacock. Cool. It's one and now the plus in Pops Art. A couple more headlines for you. First up, getting organized. Our favorite tidying team is back. Clea and Joanna from the Home Edit are returning for a second season of their hit Netflix series. This time around, their superstar organizing skills have landed them a new lineup of celebrity clientele from all across the country. Here's a peek. We are professional organizers. Post Get Organized on Netflix. Everything changed overnight. We have clients all over the country, including some celebrities. Hi. Oh, oh, wow. They have this way about them that adds a magic to the entire space. This space has just been overwhelming. Welcome okay. to the chaos. I literally have like a million props. I mean, that's why you guys are here. Challenge accepted. Wow, the big celebs on season two. I think that started with Hoda in her closet, though, a few years ago. Season two of Get Organized with the home edit that streams on Netflix on April 1st. Coming up, and finally, Julia. On Tuesday, HBO dropped the first trailer for a new biographical series about the culinary icon Julia Child, starring Sarah Lancashire and David Hyde Pierce. The show's going to follow the famous chef's career with her long-running cooking show. Here's a peek of that. Now, I've had a recurring thought that I'd like to propose to you. An educational cooking show hosted by myself. Feels flimsy to me. This is public television, for God's sake. Shouldn't we go with someone with a more camera-friendly look and a less distinctive sound? You were onto something so big. I'm just sorry that my colleagues don't have the vision to see it yet. Where are these gentlemen? One of the advantages of looking like me is that you learn at a young age how not to take no for an answer. <laughs> Uh, foodies everywhere are going to love that. That looks good. Julia hits HBO on March 31st. Those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. Coming up, a look at the Gilded Age with one of its stars. Stick around. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? 
What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. And welcome back to Popstart Plus, the new HBO show. Well, it's an HBO Max show. It's called The Gilded Age, and it's from the creator of Downton Abbey. It portrays what the transformative time of the 1880s New York might have looked like. Danae Benton plays Peggy Scott and told us her work has reminded her that she's always belonged. New York is a collection of villages. The old have been in charge since before the revolution, until the new people invaded. How I would describe the Gilded Age is just finery at its best meets really exciting social drama. I hope you're not against Miss Scott. She'll disrupt things. Maybe we need a bit of disruption. Peggy Scott. I feel like I'm deeply in love with her. She is a young, aspiring writer. As a black woman in the 1880s, she's educated. Her father owns a pharmacy. She's supposed to inherit the pharmacy, but she has her own dreams. There aren't any colored writers, especially women writers, who can make a living wage. I will soon find out how much colored women writers make. I remember when I read Peggy's breakdown and I saw myself so completely and I felt protective of her because she felt like this spiritual ancestor of mine that kind of also came to remind me that I've always belonged. I think that there's so many limiting perspectives for black people and black artists what we take in from the media, from our history books about what we can and can't be and the idea of being the first is kind of this illusion that keeps you cut off from your power and from your history and I always dealt with not quite feeling like I belonged. And then I saw Peggy and I was like, oh my God, I've always existed. You know, people who move through the world like me, black women who move through the world like me, and that tightrope that we walk has always been there. And so it's been really healing actually to get to share Peggy and get to be this intimate in relationship with, with her story. Have you ever thought about writing anything political, Miss Scott? I have. Don't ask her if she's a Republican. Well, why should I align myself with either party when I don't have the right to vote? Working with this entire cast has been a masterclass. As a theater kid, I mean, I don't know if there's any scenes without a Tony nominee or Tony winner present. It's so I was just fangirling inside all the time. And then Audra was just the icing on the cake that I didn't even dare imagine. I couldn't have, you know, my 15 year old self like obsessively watching her YouTube videos and seeing her do for me what I hope what, what I hope Peggy gets to do for other um, young black girls is like so special. I'm going now. You just remember, we are all held fast, frozen in time until you finally allow us to move forward. Honestly, all of the scenes that I got to shoot in the Scott house were just so amazing. They were written so well. The set, like walking into this brownstone and having the whole set decorated with these photographs, these true photographs of black families from this time, black upper class families from this time. It was like images that have been really hidden from all of us in this country. We all had so much fun shooting that scene with Marion in the shoes. Like, we all just viscerally had our own experience with that type of white nonsense, including Louisa. Old shoes. 
I thought... What did you think, Miss Brooke? That we would need cast-off shoes? We're like laughing between takes at the looks that, you know, the housekeeper was giving her. It was just, it was so alive. Louisa and I talked a lot about Peggy and Marion's relationship, and we also talked about the nuances of intimacy between black and white women right now in 2022 and what makes it difficult and challenging and where white supremacy really gets in the way of true sisterhood getting to form. And so we were like, how do we show a true honest relationship develop that also really gets to honor the time it would take to build that trust? I want viewers to see that we all have our divine right to our own sovereignty and to carving out a life path that makes sense to us. And I think that as a black woman, it's kind of a radical act. She's 20 years out of a country where she literally couldn't have owned her own body as, her, as herself. And so I want black people to see that kind of freedom and access to the story that's always been theirs and always will be. And I want the United States at large to really just take ownership of the true diversity that has made up this nation and that the story that we see doesn't exist without every type of person existing on every level. I'm really excited for the audience to get to finally find out what all of Peggy's secrets are. You know, my mom, everyone's always like, why is she meeting with that lawyer? What's going on? You know, and so we will definitely get to see that story unfold and see the path it sets her on. And I think her and Marion kind of come to these crossroads moments of, um, are they gonna choose themselves? Or are they gonna choose this other path? And so I think everyone will be excited to see that. And then I think season two, for my character, I, I'm hearing whispers of just getting to go even deeper into the nuances of her world and to the nuances of the black world at that time. And so I am really thrilled about that. You can catch new episodes of The Gilded Age Monday nights on HBO and streaming on HBO Max. Coming up, our visit with a friend in Studio 1A. That's right, the delightful Courtney Cox. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. And we're back. Courtney Cox, everyone's favorite tidy friend, is returning to the small screen in Shining Veil on Stars. She plays a mom who senses things are not quite right when her family moves into an old mansion. And Courtney stopped by Studio 1A to tell us all about the new show. Courtney Cox. 
Cox starred as everyone's favorite tidy friend, Monica Geller on NBC's hit sitcom. And now she is returning to the small screen. It's a spooky new show. Courtney plays a wife and a mother of two going through a midlife crisis who seems to be the only member of her family seeing spirits in their new and haunted home. Courtney, this sounds like perfect for you. I was just thinking like it takes scream. It takes a little fun with friends. It's like the perfect combo. It really is. It's, yeah. the, it's, pro it's just one of the greatest times in my life that I get to play a character that is so layered. She is a mother of a teenage daughter. Yeah. She is going through depression, menopause, <laughs> uh, writer's block, um, you name it. And she's trying to get her family back together after having uh, an affair with the handyman. Oh, so totally yeah. normal. And, yeah. and it's totally <laughs> creepy, too. Like, yeah. there's a part of it that's really, like, scary. Oh, it's scary. scary, yeah. Mira, Sor Mira Sorvino, who is an incredible actor, plays uh, the character named Rosemary, who, I mean, like she is the ghost, she's got a very too. dark past, and she is at this house, and... She's scary. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so, did you, when you read the script, did you say, yeah, that's for me? Absolutely, the first thing. I mean, yeah. it was created by uh, Sharon Horgan, yeah. who's this incredible actress, writer, yeah. and Jeff Astroff, who I've known since Friends. Uh -huh. So, it's got this perfect combination of it's a dark comedy, it's also, you know, really, really scary. And, um, I just I couldn't be happier with it. It's, and it's fun. Did you shoot it on in the same lot that you shot Friends? Yeah. How weird was that? I know. Stage five. It's the first year we shot Friends, and mm -hmm. I walked in, and that's where I do my writing in the show. Mm -hmm. And I just all these memories flooded back. We had one bathroom, <laughs> and it just where the unchanged. Uh, most of the cast would play poker, and I was uh -huh. watching the OJ trial. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what you did during. Um, you're, I cannot believe your daughter is 17. I know. Are you freaking out? Is she, is she are you an empty nester yet? I'm going to be, oh yeah. God. And I didn't think about it for a while. And recently it hit me. And uh, that that's going to be tough. What, what, how do you anticipate it being? Like, do you think, will everything be different for you I when I think that happens? so. I mean, she is the kind of kid that's either in her room or out. So <laughs> there will be things like, I didn't notice she was here anyway. She's very <laughs> independent. And, uh, but I, it's going to be hard for sure. I, by the way, she's got a beautiful singing voice. I got, I've got to listen to her on your on your Instagram a little bit. It's really good. She's is, really good. Is that something she's thinking about? Oh, for pursuing? sure. She's going to go into the arts and a hundred percent. How about you? You're like playing the piano and you just yell to her, "Coco, come sing!" And she's like, "No, oh, I'm no. not coming." She just does. I can't get her to do anything. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about just the dishes. I cannot get her to help me on the. To, I just want her to sing for me on a little piano. No, <laughs> she won't. Um, and I, uh, your house, I was just, just watching some of the stuff you do. It seems like such a fun place to be. You invite in, like you'll have Ed Sheeran, Elton John said that people are coming over for dinner. What is life like at your, at your home? Well, I've been having these Sunday gatherings forever because there's really no community in LA. It's so spread out. I don't yeah. have any family there. My clo close, closest sisters in Newport. So mm -hmm. I've been doing this for the longest I can remember. My grandmother used to do it. I have 21 first cousins. So I, I kind of need that. You have 21 gathering. first cousins? Yeah. So now that I live in LA, I have all kinds of people. Yeah. I mean, that was a real coup to have Elton John. That doesn't. Well, how did that, that even happen? come to be? What was Ed that? Ed invited him for dinner because he was staying there, and I was obviously in awe. And, but, but I do have a really interesting group. It, it could change every week. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, it's it's nice. You meet you meet people that you would never normally meet, and I don't mean famous. I'm just talking about regular, just great people. Wow. Um, we're both 57, which when I was reading that, I was just like, wow. And you talked about, I think it was to one of the magazines, about how you, we were all chasing our youth. We want to go, you know, we want to go back in time. And how, how, have, how do you feel about that as we sit here in these chairs today? Well, I had made some comment that was really blown out of proportion. Yeah. I wasn't trying to teach anybody anything. It's, it, I was just talking about myself, and it was years ago. But I mean, aging is not easy, but you just, um, at a certain point, you just relax into it and, and are happy with the parts that are good about it. I mean, I used to come here and would have been a nervous wreck, and now I'm older. Totally chill. I'm comfortable. I just talk you to you all day. You used to be a nervous wreck here? <laughs> well, I was just thinking, who does this? And it's all live, and oh yeah. my God, him timing, and <laughs> four seconds, waved to the camera. <laughs> now it's like, okay. you just, yeah, you're different, a different place. Are you yeah. happy right now? Oh, yeah, I'm really happy. By the way, your I man is hot. Uh, yes, yeah. you have a great man. Are you guys getting married or? Um, you know, we've been together for eight years, yeah. and he's just, I, I don't, I don't 
we don't think about marriage. We just are happy. Yeah. You're just happy. Yeah. Like Goldie and Kurt. You're just happy. Yeah. Yeah. And he's so talented. And I, I still have a talent crush. <laughs> See, that's the coolest. And a great voice. He's got a great voice, too. I don't mean singing. I sometimes just say, do you mind leaving me a voice message, <laughs> even so though we can, just hung up? Just so you can listen <laughs> to him. Wow. Well, good luck with this show. I hope a lot Thank of people you. check it out. It's called Shining Veil. It premieres Sunday night on Stars. Courtney, thank you for coming to see thank us. You. And we should mention Shining Veil premieres again on Stars Sunday night. Still to come, we're marking 30 years, if you can believe it, of the classic My Cousin Vinny. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News now welcome back to pop star plus you know this month marks 30 years since the release of the beloved my cousin Vinny Joe Pesci starring as a wise guy Brooklyn lawyer who travels south to defend an innocent relative and he joined today back in 1992 to fill us all in on that role Vinny Gambini what's he like uh, well, he's a street guy from Brooklyn who has a lot of heart, a little tough guy, but um, he uses all his street smarts and uh, whatever brightness he has to uh, try to get his cousin out of jail who's being uh, held for murder in Alabama. So uh, it's a lot of fun when he gets down there. Yeah, it, Vinny's fairly unsophisticated about the judicial process. Uh, in terms of the movie, is he, is he ignorant? Well, I don't think he's ignorant. I mean, he just, well, he's ignorant to the process in the court. He's never been in the uh, courtroom before. So uh, he doesn't know what he's doing, but he learns. He watches the other lawyer and um, he reads. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't show in the film uh, that was probably cut out somewhere along in the editing was that he's dyslexic. So uh, his big problem is that he can't uh, read fast enough, so it's, it's hard for him, uh -huh. and it's uh, pretty funny. How much freedom, Joe, did you have in terms of defining Vinny's character? I had a lot of freedom. Uh, I always start off that way with the director and producers. I, you know, I get a vision of what I think the character should look like and what he should be like from the script, and uh, then I usually go with that, and they let me, thank God. Is it true what I heard that you used the character that you played in, in Raging Bull um, to, to help you define Vinny? No, I heard that too. Uh, I think that uh, somehow the writer said that when he was writing it, he had, uh, he may have said that he had me in mind and uh, maybe from, from seeing yeah. Raging Bull, but I certainly don't see any similarities. I think Vinny uses his street smarts to, uh, to better himself in a way. Uh, you know, to educate himself better and, you know, he wants to be an attorney. So he's looking for a better life for himself, not just a street kid, you know. All right, let's run the clip in here and, and, and I'll set it up. Um, one of the, um, the two youths who charged, uh, uh, innocent youths, I might add, who are charged yeah. in an Alabama town with murder is your cousin. This is where the two of them meet you and try to decide who's representing them. Uh -huh. What kind of cases have you had? Assault and battery, armed robbery, you know? No. Well, I expect he's done burglary, grand theft auto, drugs, right, Vin? Nope. Nothing like that either. What kind, what kind, what kind of law do you practice? 
Well, up till now, uh, personal injury. <laughs> well, you're a trial attorney, right? I mean, personal injury trials. Well, actually, this would be my first foray into the trial process. I haven't had to go to court yet. Knock on wood. You haven't had to go to court yet. How long have you been practicing? Almost six weeks. But then you graduated from law school six years ago. What have you been doing since? Studying for the bar. Six years? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of studying. Hey, Joe, this role combined with your parts in, in the Super, the, the Home Alone series, the Lethal Weapons series, are giving you a reputation for comedy. Is that, is that the plan? Uh, no, it's not really the plan. It's just, I, you know, I take things as they come. Uh, the scripts as they come along that I like, I wind up doing. So uh, it's been uh, running into comedies, and uh, I'll go along with whatever yeah. comes, as long as it's a good script, you know. You're an actor who's in demand right now, and what criteria are you, are you accepting or declining scripts? Um, geez, I don't know. I just, uh, I have to really like the characters and enjoy it myself. That's basically what I go by. You, um, you've you been making movies back-to-back -back for nearly three years right now. Is that the kind of schedule you want to keep? No, I have to slow up so that I can work on my golf game so I can beat you. Well, you lost last time, but look, um, let me... <laughs> no, I didn't lose. You wait didn't... a minute, wait a minute. What? I get shots and I won, remember? Well, you get shots and we flatted. You... you... <laughs> <laughs> <You're... laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up, but don't worry about it. Look, um, one, quick, one quick quote from an interview I saw you said to the LA Times, and I'm quoting you, okay? It yeah. says, at this point, I'm sick of making movies. I have three movies coming out next year, but I might not make any more after that. I mean it. I might just stop. Hmm. I don't think I had that much money. <laughs> <laughs> you, still, uh, you don't still feel don't that way. I, well, I wanna st I'll probably stop for a little bit. I mean, I need a rest. That's, that's somebody talking that just needs a rest, I think, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll probably, after, after Home Alone, which ends in April, I'll probably try to get at least a month off, and I think that'll cool me out a little bit. I mean, I have to do this. It's, you know, it's something that I really have to do. It's not, uh, yeah. I just love to act, so I'm, I'm going to wind up uh, doing it until I probably croak on, behind the camera. All right. After that, we'll have a rematch. I mean, in front of the camera, not I, behind it. I understood what you meant. Oh, what a classic. Who doesn't love My Cousin Vinny? Plus, it landed Marissa Tomei an Oscar. Well, that's going to do it for today's Pop Star Plus. Be sure and join us right back here tomorrow. Have a great day. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. you got to have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Okay. Will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day.
So um, at the time, I was living in Paris. I was just a couple months out of college, and I was working as a paralegal and pursuing this other, you know, stringer position on the side. And I hadn't been feeling well for a while. It started with an itch, and the itch blossomed into all kinds of mysterious symptoms. Mm -hmm. I was getting colds all the time and coming down with bouts of bronchitis. Uh, But the biggest symptom I had was fatigue. Mm. But of course, at 22, everyone is tired. Everyone that I was hanging out with was working hard and going out at night dancing. And so I didn't really make much of it. And I went to see a number of doctors, all of whom, you know, treated that specific symptom or ailment and sent me home. And toward the end of my time in Paris, I started to get the feeling that my doctors that I was seeing weren't taking me seriously. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth is I wasn't entirely taking myself seriously. Mm. And it was only when I got to a point where I was so weak, it was a struggle to walk up and down the stairs that I found myself in an emergency room. And within 24 hours, I was on a plane back home to upstate New York and I got the bone marrow biopsy that led to my actual diagnosis. To hear the words that you were diagnosed with a specific type of leukemia at 22 is scary enough, but when they said the chances of survival were one in three, I mean, my God, like yeah. what does a, what goes through a 22 year old's head? I think there was this immediate sense of fracture. There was my life before yeah. and everything that came after. And, you know, I never returned to Paris, to my apartment, to my job. Friends packed up my things and, and mm. sent them to my house. And I had this sense, even though I couldn't quite wrap my head around what it meant to have a cancer diagnosis at 22, that the person I'd been before was buried. There was Mm. no returning Mm. to that pre-diagnosis self. The cancer fight, and I don't know how you describe it, but it usually there's a beginning and an end point for it. I mean, I had breast cancer, I think for six or eight months, I went through stuff. Yeah. Your timing, the, the three and a half, was it three and a half, four years of going through chemo and bone marrow and chemo again. How did you see light and how Mm -hmm. did you survive all those days? One of the most challenging parts of that experience was the sense of the goalposts moving. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, on day one that I was going to be in treatment for three and a half years. And they say you can survive anything as long as you can see the end date in sight. And there came a point in my treatment where I couldn't see that end in sight. Mm. And That was the most challenging, I think, to know how to kind of anchor yourself when you're swimming in a sea of uncertainty. I mean, there are life lessons that come in your worst times. I mean, some change we we choose in our life and some is cast upon us and Mm. you have to figure it out. And I don't know, I remember so clearly how the world got clear. Like it, I was never clear. I think I was kind of always mushy about things. Mm. Those are my friends. I don't love that one so much, but so what? They're nice. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then all of a sudden you realize like my life has a beginning and an end and I'm not wasting time. Like that time is over. Yeah. Did you have that sensation? Yeah, I think like, you know, a lot of people in their early 20s, I had this feeling of time. Yes. I had time to figure out who I was, time to figure out what I wanted to do. And that diagnosis brought into immediate, urgent focus, the fact that we're all here for a finite Mm -hmm. period of time. And I felt a strange sense of urgency around time Mm -hmm. and I had the same experience it felt like all the artifice just kind of fell away yeah I got clear not only about who my friends were but maybe more importantly who I wanted to be friends with and what Mm. kind of relationships I wanted to cultivate and I had such limited energy that I was well enough to maybe do three things every day, small Mm. things like write an email, watch a movie, see a friend. And what that meant for me was that I had to get very clear about my priorities. Wow. 
That is so true. And it, there's something so strange about how free you feel suddenly. You didn't even realize you were carrying all that heavy junk around. Yeah. It's like, I didn't even, you know, you don't even realize it. It's like my shoulders feel lighter, even Perfect. though you're in the middle of it. So to have a doctor say to you after a bone marrow transplant and chemo again, okay, I don't know if he used the term cancer free or mm -hmm. you are in remission, but to hear those words, what did, what did that moment feel like? Mm. I mean, I had been hoping to hear those words for almost three and a half years. The goal had always been to survive. And I'd spent, you know, 1400 days working tirelessly oh, toward that goal. And I thought when I got to that place, I would want to celebrate. Yeah, I wanted to feel grateful. I wanted to quickly and organically fold back into the rhythms of living. But instead, I found myself in this kind of limbo, this kind of in between place where on paper, I was better. Mm -hmm. But off paper, I couldn't have felt further from being the healthy, happy, you know, 27 year old that I'd hoped to be on the other side of all this, well, especially because when you spend almost well, three and a half years in one space, the I it's the same thing, the idea that, okay, now this is over and all your friends or some of your friends and colleagues are saying, oh, great. So now we can go back to the way it was. Let's go out to the bar. Let's go have some fun. Exactly. You weren't feeling those things. Yeah, I wanted to be you feeling wanted those to, yeah. things. But, you know, I think often when we talk about things like cancer, the kind of final act yeah. or the end of the story is comes with a cure. Uh, but we mm -hmm. don't talk a lot about what happens after. Mm -hmm. And... It took me a, a while to even acknowledge to myself how much I was struggling. There were so many unanswered questions that I didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do I find a job when I need to nap for four hours mm -hmm. in the day or my immune system is still sending me to the emergency room on mm -hmm. a regular basis? How do I date when I have a quarter inch of hair and a port still in my chest, how do I talk about, you know, the side effects of chemo, like infertility or early menopause? Like all of it felt so overwhelming. And in a weird way, I found myself almost wishing that I was still sick, not because I wanted to have leukemia, of course, but I understood the hospital ecosystem. Right. That was the world right. I lived in for four years. I felt comfortable there. I looked like the other patients. It was the outside world mm -hmm. that felt scary and foreign and daunting to me. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. 
This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. So I love your New York Times column. I thought it was so beautiful and riveting and moving. But what I loved so much more was when people reached out to you because they wanted because they, they connected with you. You had mm -hmm. this way that whether you were sick before or you weren't or you knew, somehow people felt you, like they, you reached across and you grabbed them by the heart. Mm -hmm. And people wrote you letters. And you know, in, in this industry, sometimes you get a letter and you got beautiful letters and you read them, but then you did something totally amazing. Like I have not, <laughs> I have not heard of someone doing this, but what did you do with those letters that you got? So, you know, in that year after I finished treatment, I was in the most lost place yeah. I've ever been. I knew I wasn't a cancer patient anymore. I knew I couldn't return to the person I'd been pre-diagnosis, but I had no idea who I was. And so I started thinking about these different rites of passages that we have in our culture, these kind of ritualized ceremonies that help us move through transitions mm -hmm. like baby showers and mm -hmm. weddings and funerals. And I realized that there wasn't a kind of ritual or rite of passage when you emerge from a long illness. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. I needed time to reckon with what I'd been through and to reflect on yeah. who I wanted to become. I needed the space away from my home and my kind of cancer identity to really kind of come into my own. And so I hatched this kind of boondoggle <laughs> of a plan and I decided to learn how to drive. You hadn't, you didn't have your license. I did not have my license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I rented out my apartment yep. and I borrowed a friend's car and I ended up embarking on a 15,000 mile road trip across the country to meet some of the strangers who'd written me letters about their own major life interruptions mm. and their own stories of transition. And they really, you know, those individuals, there were about 22 of them that I visited, became my sort of breadcrumb trail through the wilderness of survivorship. Mm. I was always prepared for the other shoe to drop, uh. prepared for something to go wrong. And what I found instead in these encounters and on that road trip was that the world really welcomed me at mm. every turn. I ended up, you know, staying on someone's fold out couch. I stayed on a ranch in Wyoming with a family of survivalist ranchers. I visited a high school teacher in California who was grieving the death of her son. I oh. went to uh, a maximum security prison in Texas to visit a death row convict. And each of those conversations helped me gain a sense of perspective mm. on my own predicament. But more than that, I think it showed me a way to reimagine community. And it gave me this sense of connection that at a time in my life when I felt so lost and so isolated really helped me see a path forward. Are you happy? I'm so happy. <laughs> what, what makes you happy now? The strange thing in the last year of this pandemic is I found myself uh, living a, a version of the life that I had when I was sick, which mm. is to say that my circle is much smaller, smaller right. my life is quieter. And I don't know about you, but I have spent so much of the last decade striving and working and hustling, and I feel so privileged to get to do work that I love. Mm -hmm. But I've also been thinking about the way that, that working at that pace can be its own kind mm -hmm. of trauma response. Mm -hmm. So this year for me, my goal has been leisure. Uh, which isn't to say I'm not working all the of time, you are. yeah. But you know these small moments that I've gotten to have in the last year of of being at home with our dogs, of gardening, of hanging out with my partner John. Of you know, it's so interesting because I I sometimes think like life is 
full of exclamation points. It's like the good ones. You graduated from college, you meet a great guy, you have a baby, you get married, and then on the flip side, it's you get a sad diagnosis, somebody passes away, etc. But most of the days mm -hmm. are just Wednesday yeah. in the middle. Nothing terrific and nothing horrible, just Wednesday. Yeah, something I've been thinking about recently is trying to approach my Wednesday as ritual, hmm. washing the dishes as ritual, mm -hmm. gardening as ritual, and really trying to kind of slow down and savor that because it's so easy to move from one exclamation point to the next. But I'm sure as you know, you know, when you get a scary diagnosis, you're not thinking about the things that are on your resume. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about the people you love mm -hmm. and wanting to spend time with them. You're thinking about the things that nourish you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all the rest doesn't matter as much and it falls away. You know, we live in a country that has this culture uh, or this anxiety of around accomplishment. Um, and in this season in my life, I'm trying very hard um, to resist that and, and to kind of center myself back and those things that I love, the same things that I loved as a little girl, the dancing and music and, and writing and, and family. Speaking of music, music has always been a big part of your life. Music has always been a big part of my life. Which explains your very handsome and awesome boyfriend. <laughs> if you don't know John Baptiste, and we're going to bring him in here in just a second, but he's a cool cat. Boy, is he something special. He is. NBC News, streaming free now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I'm sitting smack dab in the middle of a love story. <laughs> um, okay, so you're 13 years old. You're both geeks. I know you are at 13 because nobody was not a geek at 13. Oh, yes. So are you guys close to the same age? Yeah, we're about a year and a half apart. A year and a half apart. Mm -hmm. So, uh, John, do you remember uh, your girl from band camp at age 13? <laughs> so, here's what I remember. Uh huh. I remember Birkenstocks. This is not an endorsement. You had Birkenstocks on? Before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> she was ahead. Suleika was ahead. Now, and I also must say, 
I am am honored to talk to you because when I was growing up at that time, I was watching you on WWL. Come on, uh, come on. <laughs> so when I was growing up in New Orleans, in Kenton, Louisiana, uh-huh. you'd be on TV. My first time leaving was to go to this band camp. First time leaving <laughs> home and being somewhere for the summer. You go somewhere for the summer for the first time, it's like a new world. Yeah, where you, was band camp? Where were you? Saratoga Springs. Oh, so you took a big trip. This yeah. was not a nothing. All oh. right. Upstate New York. So you were already, what <laughs> instrument were you playing, John, at the time? Piano. And I saw her in the courtyard. And this is, you know, again, I thought this was maybe a New York thing. People wear Birkenstocks. <laughs> Nobody was wearing that in New Orleans. <laughs> no, they weren't. Those were not cool in New Orleans. And I thought it, what, what immediately came to my mind was, oh, she's like a, a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like granola. Like <laughs> that vibe. granola. <laughs> Uh, and how did you at 13 were you at did you have any confidence level at 13 or were you like a lot of 13 year old girls you did she did definitely I was a 13 year old going on 20 I thought I was far more mature than I actually was that's impressive most 13 year old girls feel so incredibly awkward I was just coming out of what I call UDS, ugly duckling syndrome. <laughs> I'd just gotten contacts for the first oh, time to replace my, uh-huh. my bottle Definitely. thick glasses. Okay, so now at 13, that's when the crushes start happening. Did, was there a crush or was, were you all just friends? No, no, no crush. Yeah. I would. I was very much a uh, late bloomer. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I was into music and video games uh-huh. and martial arts and chess. <laughs> things like Eclectic. that. Eclectic. You got a nice array. Uh, all the nerdy activities. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say all the introspective kind okay. of uh, introvert activities. Yeah. So you so, see. So like a, when you saw him, was did you just thought a, a, a nice kid, nice guy? <laughs> I remember thinking he was a little strange because I I think I tried to initiate a conversation and conversation was not happening. You were not into it. You just weren't a conversationalist then. I think. There's a glorious awkwardness <laughs> in uh, coming into your own at that age. Yeah, and it's I think weird. I, it's it's strange, but a beautiful strange. And I feel like I've kept that until adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I still, you know, I feel like we probably tried to speak, and at that time, anybody who I talked to, yeah, and she's always been a great communicator, yeah. always magnetic, always yeah. able to communicate. She's got it the emotions that other people are feeling I, I noticed that about her immediately yeah. um but there was no crush we 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 linked later in college and that's when we started to really become more friends you know what's weird mm-hmm. i on my first my first week at juilliard i was on the one train with my friend michelle and i had no you know i hadn't thought about john since band camp several years earlier which when you're a teenager feels like a decade (laughs) and I see this young man on the train who is singing to himself and playing the air piano and people were kind of staring because even in New York that's not a sight that you see every day and I looked at him and I turned to my friend and I said that's John Batiste what is he doing here and I said, that's the man I'm going to marry someday. Wait, And I just wait, blurted wait, it out wait, and forgot stop about it. it. St- I want to stop for a second. <laughs> On the one train, you knew you were going to marry John? It, it was like one of those things you just say, and I didn't think about it, and I didn't give it much weight. <laughs> so is that the last you see of her before you know she's not feeling well? No. Mm-hmm. We, we saw each other. This is in college, my yeah. first year, her last year of high school then she doesn't end up going to Julia. Right. she goes to princeton then right. at princeton she has this um incredible time we don't see each other in passing we see each other at performances here and there right. we have mutual friends but we're not really as connected, connected. yeah then she has a going away party because she's moving you move into paris and i went to the going away party with a mutual friend of ours mm-hmm. but then that was when there was a, a spark at that party the oh. going away party but oh, she was going away. Going to Paris. So bye. That it was not you know oh, the time. You were pining, John, <laughs> a little, a little. You're pining we a had little. A, a moment. Uh-huh. We had a moment. Well, you got to have a moment. I mean, yeah. come on, going to Paris, y'all. There's love in the air. Yes. Okay, so let's fast forward to how did you learn that Suleika was was ill, was not well? So that same friend Michelle told me one day we. Um, were playing, you know, my band, we would play in public places often, mm-hmm. you know, 
for not for money, just to bring mm -hmm. the music, revelry, mm -hmm. joy. Uh, we were playing in the subway one day, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. she told me, and I gathered the rest of my band, because at this time it was just a few of us, mm -hmm. and I gathered the rest of them, and we went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I hadn't heard that she was that ill until that moment. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a real moment of clarity that I had to do something. And what mm -hmm. I do is music. I just felt I needed to bring that to the situation to help in any way that I could. So that's what I did. But that must have been emotional because you didn't expect to, to see her in that way. I, I, I guess there's an impact that a person has on you that you don't know the full extent of until you're in a moment of mm -hmm. crisis. So it felt like I needed to do something in that moment. Even though we weren't super close friends, it felt like, oh, I really connect with this person. I respect this person, what she's all about, what I know of her. This is this is important. So that's why we went to the, to the hospital and we played and it was a beautiful experience. Did you feel like you were doing some good? Yes, I, I felt like we were doing good, but that's that was a, a special thing for our relationship, a special time to, to, you know, you see each other through these different phases and you see what a person is like when they're 13, 14. Then you see what a person is like at the beginning of college you see what a person is like when they finish college and going out into the world. Then you see what a person is like when they're going through tremendous duress, the impact of that on their life, meeting the family, understanding, you know, how that impacts a whole community. But it's also <laughs> a testament to John, because John is someone who, who shows up in the difficult moments and who keeps on showing up, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm. Um, and he's always been that way. <laughs> Well, I, you, you, you got to show them. <laughs> you got to show people you love them. Mm -hmm. I, I urge everybody out there, you show the person in your life who you haven't told or you haven't shown your love, show them. So what's, uh, what's the future with you two? Well, you, we were talking about the, uh, the kids mm -hmm. you, that, that, that you have in your life. That's a beautiful thing to have family. We, uh, we look forward to something in that realm you know there's complications yeah um you know i don't i don't i don't feel like that is ever a barrier to no, family because you can not. you can plenty of ways out. to make mm -hmm. a family right yeah I, I think it's possible it's it's all about love well and i'll just say like i think one of my big anxieties coming out of this illness was finding a partner who understood that mm -hmm. and who wasn't sort of scared of having hard conversations or awkward mm -hmm. conversations around things. Um, and I remember talking to John about infertility early on mm -hmm. uh, as a result of my treatment. And he said, there are many ways to make a family mm. and it's its own kind of creative act. And you've just been understanding and, and open in a way that I wish were the norm. Um, wow. But that I feel very grateful for. It's She's got to be real. Come. She's a very real person. By the way. <laughs> Eloquent, but she can say <laughs> she's real. So you, it's easy to have real, authentic conversations. Well, you know, I think John is one of the most creatively brilliant people I know. But what I've loved observing and learning from is the way creativity informs every aspect of his life including our relationship mm. and so one example of that is we both travel a lot for work in non-pandemic times and because of that have to spend sometimes several weeks apart and he came up with this idea early on in our relationship which was to write each other a letter mm. every day by hand instead of doing like your morning morning pages or writing in a journal he would write a letter by hand take a photo of it and text it to me. And I it brought me that. back to those letters <gasps> that I got on the road trip. Wow. And mm. I think that there's sometimes certain things that you can only say in the written word that you don't even maybe know you need to say that come out when you're writing letters. Um, but you're always doing stuff like that. You're always finding creative ways for mm. us to deepen our relationship and to stay connected. By the way, that is the most beautiful and thoughtful and smart. I was thinking, write a letter, but how are you ever going to get it? 
you take a picture and text it so you can actually read the handwriting. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> Joel and I are stealing that. Thank you. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's so beautiful because watching your story from the beginning unfold, and I've been, I've been reading and watching a lot leading up to this interview, and sitting here in this moment and looking at you two is so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Love is in the air, baby. Aww. Yes. <laughs> All right, Suleika, John, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you being on Making Space. New York City is home to so many iconic foods, but when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels. Rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels. And of course, you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. Something about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for, because you, you usually you'd see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank <laughs> goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Ann. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. Your boss. Yeah. And I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Ann became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start and so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings. 
the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know the cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. NBC News, streaming free now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women 
who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. Uh, you're here in the, the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost Look at translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right, so, so uh, I watch people slice and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be which, the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick Slice. Are you making so, faces at me? Huh? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Howie. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick we call slice. call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that, sound, that didn't sound Yiddish. <laughs> not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. No. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. 
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there, and you better believe I'm going to find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly 8 million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Caslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse-drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah. So this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, this is the bone. Uh -huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're going to grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. 
and we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally we would probably draw a wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish, but for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay, that's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the oven? You up? bet. All right. All right, hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the US. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Please, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots 
by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. Now we're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, and so how did you, was it look like, like yeah. you thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really it. fascinated okay all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by I'm, smelling yeah. it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. It's another secret ingredient. Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba. Yeah, are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you gotta drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pour okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we did same before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking, just ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Ch -ch -ch Chai talking. Cheers. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. 
Okay, well, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> a bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. We're back now with our special series, Together We Rise. We are celebrating the experiences, cultures, and trailblazers shaping America. Okay, and today we want you to meet the designer behind some of the boldest looks you're seeing across Hollywood and in your Instagram feed. Take a look. This is Christopher John Rogers' world. I kind of feel like every day is a pinch me moment. Colors so bright, a future even brighter. In the last two years, Christopher John Rogers has been awarded CFDA's Emerging Artist of the Year, Vogue Fashion Fund's top prize, and he was named one of Forbes 30 under 30. You've had a really crazy couple of years. Yeah. That makes it seem like this happened overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know that's not true. I knew that, that this is where I wanted to end up, but I didn't know how I would get there. Working full-time jobs and then coming home in the evening, cutting fabric, sketching, you know, taking my lunch break to go to fittings or going to factories. Two to three years after I moved to New York City was really when I started to sort of see things happen. I also read that church, going to church, yeah. was kind of an inspiration for all this too. Absolutely. How, how so? I think that was kind of like my weekly fashion show in a way. I mean, every Sunday, like going to church and seeing people in head to toe green or head to toe white or head to toe yellow, these really sort of ostentatious colors, but sort of presented in a really straightforward, pragmatic way was really inspiring to me. As a kid, Christopher used whatever scraps of material he could find to bring his creative vision to life. I can't help but think of your grandma and your parents like seeing something in you, yeah. but allowing you the freedom to really grow into whoever you wanted to be. Right. How did, how did that play into all of this? One thing I really appreciate about my family, my friends, and all the people that were around me is that I, I never felt um, strange or weird or like I didn't fit in. And I think kind of just really being able to explore who I was without limits and all of the nuances of myself and the things that I was interested in and the people that are around me were interested in really sort of led me to this, this place. Christopher's work seems to be everywhere you look, from Beyonce to Cynthia Nixon, Lizzo to Vice President Kamala Harris. But it's dressing the everyday woman that drives Christopher's designs. Initially when I start a collection or when I think of pieces, I really think of our clients and so real, people are people who aren't necessarily celebrities, but I think it's always really exciting to be able to know that you sort of touch someone from an aesthetic point of view and from an emotional point of view. What happens when somebody that hasn't worn this type of vibrant, saturated beauty before, like what happens when somebody puts on your clothes when they're not used to wearing something that you make? One story that I've heard is that um, when they put on these clothes for the first time, it's sort of reminded them of being a kid mm -hmm. and they sort of released all of the expectations of what it must mean to dress like an adult or to be chic and I think really sort of making clothes that allow you to flux and flow between a childlike exploration fashion and fantasy and really sort of needing to navigate the real world as an adult I think is exciting. Your fourth grade self creating like comic books out of garbage bags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could he have even dreamt of this? But I think he did, and it's kind of crazy to be here. There are millions of clothes in the world, and for all of these different types of folks to find themselves in the work, it's really beautiful, and it makes me really happy. I couldn't be more grateful. Don't you love I can't. that answer? I think he did, and now look where he is. His grandmother has passed away, mm. but he said to me, I know she would be looking oh. down and be so, so proud oh. of everything that he's created. And it's super cool. So that his team that he's working with now is the same group of friends he met freshman year at Savannah School of Design, College of Art and Design. Right, but it tells you everything. And what he touched on that said it made you remember what it was like to be a kid yes. but still be a grown-up, he hit something. It's like hits a nerve. When you, you walk in 
into a studio, it's like everything yeah. is bright and there's something about that. He also said he likes one element of each dress to be slightly off, off. because he doesn't want people to feel like they need to be perfect. perfect. Okay, crazy about him. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are back with Mr. Smith Goes To. And Tom's still in his PJs. And yeah. <laughs> the Winter Olympics, Harry decided to take a trip downtown to explore one of New York's most vibrant areas, Chinatown. Good morning, Harry. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Really, it does. Look <laughs> There's a lot of room in here. If you, if you guys, you guys <laughs> let me know. It's like snuggies for your legs. All right. Tell you what, you know, with the, uh, the Olympics over, and one of the th sort of sad things about that, because of COVID restrictions, mm -hmm. it's like our folks or even the athletes couldn't get around yeah. to sample the local culture, really, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, a lot of places around the country. The Chinese culture is alive and well in New York City, for instance, the biggest Chinese population in the United States, half a million people. We went down to Chinatown in Manhattan to get a little taste. A walk through New York's Chinatown is a food lover's dream journey. Our first stop, a grocery store. This is such a pure window into a thousand-year-old culture and cuisine. Our guide is Francis Lam, writer, publisher, and host of The Splendid Table on public radio. Anywhere you travel is you go to the market. You go see what people shop for. You go see what people eat. You go see what's important to people. Lam's mother shopped here, as have generations of Chinese. For here is a wall of ramen. I am probably 45% by body weight noodle. They're all these different noodles, rice noodles, Thai style, Japanese style. But the dried foods are the pride of Po Wing Fong Food Market. Delicacies. These are dried abalones. Pricey. Oh, they're wild, 220 bucks a pound. Delicious. It right. doesn't taste like a fresh oyster, it just tastes like the evil superhero version of an oyster. Like it's just darker, <laughs> moodier, you know, it's like Batman. Sophia Sao is in charge here but it's her mother who has been behind the counter for as long as anyone can remember. What does it mean to you to follow in your family's footsteps to, to be running this store now? For me personally, I like to think that I'm continuing their legacy. So I think that I'm not only just helping my family financially, but also the community. Hang around a grocery store long enough and you'll get hungry. What's our next stop? I want to take you to the second coming of a classic tofu shop that was sort of more in the heart of Chinatown. Inside, we watch the modern day version of the ancient alchemy of tofu. Paul An is the proprietor of Fong An Tofu Shop. It's starting to coagulate, and so now I'm going to cover it and yeah. it will set kind of like, like jello. The finished product, though, the texture of silk on your tongue serve sweet or savory. But you have that really, really creamy pudding. You get like the crunch of that shallot. And you get like the little crispiness of the pickles. We tried both. It's really one of those where's this been all my life sort of taste experiences. On we wandered, wanting to stop everywhere and taste even what we did not recognize. She said you can eat it raw if you want. 
What do you think? Oh my God. This is so good. It's like a, if a cucumber and a pear had a baby. The energy in Chinatown is palpable, but life here is not what it once was. In January of 2020, people stopped coming to Chinatown because it was the China virus. Many a store shuttered, some permanently. It's the economic devastation that we felt all over the country, but you layer on top of that a rise in hate crimes, a rise in racist rhetoric, a rise of scapegoating. It's rough, man. It's rough. Yet people persevere, and perhaps no place better represents that than our last stop. Waiyan, Chinese fine dining. Chef Shen Li Tang, son of the original chef, holds forth in the kitchen. Among the specialties, sesame noodles. It's killer, right? Yeah. It's like a little bit of garlic, a little bit of scallion. But you can taste everything, and every flavor kind of comes and goes. Honestly, I've, I heard, okay, we're gonna go have cold sesame noodles at this really <laughs> fancy restaurant. <laughs> this, it's like this great, exceeds, sign me up. Yeah. exceeds my expectations. Far exceeds. The shredded beef, best I've ever had. And the key? How come your food is so much better than everybody else's? Cooking for your heart. Cooking from your heart. That's Cooking from your heart. Perfect. Right? What a Cooking beautiful Isn't that the story. truth? But Chinatown, it's, it just it, the life is on the street there. Mm. Yes. You just feel the vibrancy as you walk around, and you kind of go, What's that? What's this? Stop in here. Stop in there. Taste a little of this. Taste a little well, of that. I'm glad you did that because some of us, we want to go, but we just don't know what we're buying or what to look for. Like right. that one thing that looked like a cucumber. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing was Francis didn't even know what it was. Really? That was the coolest was part. Was it sweet? It was, well, it was taste like a lemon and a zucchini and a cucumber huh. all at the same wow. time. I'm going to Fang Ong for tofu. Yeah. That looks oh amazing. That looks oh, amazing. phenomenal. And they just scoop a little Ooh. layer off yeah. at a time. And it's and a reminder of all the treasures there. You could spend Absolutely. a week in, yep. in Chinatown in New York City and That's find true. new places. Without question. The other thing about it also is one of the reasons we live in our cities is the amazing diversity. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. my and God. And cities I got all, over the, all over the country. There are right? places yep. we yeah. should visit. In the fall of 1960, Ruby Bridges was a six-year-old girl who just wanted to go to school. Instead, she became an icon, thanks in part to this Norman Rockwell painting that shows her being harassed as she is escorted by federal marshals to a previously all-white school in New Orleans. But Ruby was not alone that day. This morning, for the first time ever on network television, the other three members of the New Orleans Four tell their story with a new twist. NBC's Rahima Ellis has our Sunday Spotlight. Didn't have no clue that the color of my skin made a big difference in where I had to go to school. You could hear the, the mob saying these things. This was an angry crowd. It looked like if they could get to me, they'd kill me, and I didn't know why. The why is rooted in America's painful history of segregation. So when Gail Atien, Leona Tate, and Tessie Prevost Williams were only six years old and chosen to desegregate this school in New Orleans in the fall of 1960, they faced a tidal wave of opposition. And my daddy said, give me your hand, look straight ahead, I'm here. Federal marshals make sure no harm Also there were U.S. Marshals assigned to protect the girls, just as other marshals protected Ruby Bridges at another school not far away. Her story has become legendary, but a producer documenting New Orleans history says there's more to tell. Not to take away from what Ruby Bridges did, but it becomes much more powerful when they know that there was this hurricane of things happening all simultaneously. Gail, Leona, and Tessie now finally more vocal about what they endured in a school ultimately abandoned by white students. Where was everybody else? They came the first day of school and the parents started yanking them out. We had three little girls with a whole school to ourselves. But there was no freedom. This is our first grade classroom and these windows were papered up. No one could see in and we couldn't see outside. What was the reason? It was for our protection because of the mob. Couldn't even use a pencil sharpener. All right. Because it was too close to the window. Mm -hmm. Their childhood turned upside down for a cause. They spent the first grade confined. In this room. In this room. Not the cafeteria, no. not the playground. No. This room. 
it took a heavy toll. I was six years old on nerve medicine for a while. Because what we went through as little kids, it wasn't normal. In the years that followed in different schools, there were no U.S. Marshals protecting them. Was it rough? It was terrible. Rough is not the word. They spit on us, they tore our clothes off, ripped our dresses and spit in our food, and Gail was hit with a bat. The taunting and abuse eventually lessened. The story slipped into the shadows of history. Just visiting all those schools and the children didn't know about us. Determined to change that, Leona set out to acquire the old abandoned school. Today, with the help of a grant from the National Park Service, it will become a center for education and affordable housing, named for the three women. It's got to be a place where we need to talk, to share some dialogue. A place where a difficult past can help inform a better future. For Sunday Today, Rahima Ellis, New Orleans. Rahima, thank you very much. You can hear more stories like that one honoring the legacy and impact of America's civil rights movement at VoicesOfTheCivilRightsMovement.com. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now, Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For this team, Mount Everest isn't just a place, it's a dream. The Full Circle Everest Expedition currently training to become the first all-black climbing group to summit the world's tallest peak. Records show about 10,000 people have reached its summit in 70 years. Only 10 of those climbers have been black, with only one black American. Hopefully we can come back to the U.S. and uh, kind of teach other people how to have these big kind of adventures and go out and kind of see the world uh, as we share our experience with that. Fred Campbell is part of the team looking to shatter barriers at the top. So do you think this is just about sort of barriers to access? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I think that barriers to access is a big part. I think that uh, representation is another part. I mean, you don't see very many black climbers. And so I, I know it's a lot easier for me to imagine myself doing something if there are people that I kind of connect with. Campbell was a college football standout at Stanford until he broke his neck while playing. With football out of his future, he turned his sights to the great outdoors, learning to skydive and climb, ascending Mount Kilimanjaro with his father. I fell in love with it because it was the first time that I got to kind of do some travel and see the rest of the world. It was this incredibly intense experience where it was like physically demanding in a way that really 
uh, that I connected with. Now, he's part of a history-making team. Among them, 28-year-old climbing instructor Rosemary Saul, high school teacher Eddie Taylor, and team leader Philip Henderson, a 58-year-old climber with three decades of experience. How does it feel to be climbing with other people who look like you and have had similar experiences? It's a lot of fun. I think that uh, we have some similar backgrounds, like similar experiences growing up, similar tastes in music, and so it, there's a lot of uh, connection, and it's really easy to kind of get along and kind of like, uh, crack jokes and have fun. So it's a, uh, it's a blast. This team ready to make history at the highest level and in the highest place. What do you hope that other people take away from seeing you, from seeing this black team climb the highest mountain in the world? I hope that they see our experience and how much we love being out on the mountain and kind of enjoying the adventure. And they're inspired to find an adventure of their own. So all nine members will start their ascent this May, and some of them have bonded during training here stateside, like ascending Washington's Mount Rainier last year, along with a scouting trip to Everest's home country, Nepal. But the biggest and the tallest test, guys, it lies ahead of them, bringing their excellence to unprecedented mm -hmm. heights. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I'd okay. live stream that. I would yeah. watch yeah. that whole yeah. climb yeah. if I could. I told them I would make them a playlist. I don't know okay. if there's okay. a long there. playlist. Yeah. To to you know what? That Wi-Fi up there. Yeah. Yeah. So, not that good. I'll have to download it. Maybe a little satellite. That's a really cool story. I know. Way to go, Love Morgan. That. Really cool, yeah. Morgan. Thank, thank, thank you. So you. My name is Alex Slinka. I'm 18 years old, and I'm an amateur bodybuilder as well as a full-time college student. If people ask me, I always say I'm not a transgender bodybuilder. I do not want to be labeled as a transgender bodybuilder. I'm a bodybuilder that happens to be trans. <laughs> For me, being transgender is not something that should limit you or define you. Mm. Come on. Mm. So tell me about your clients, Alex. I, I understand that you got another two yesterday, yeah, right? So between a bunch of toys, he would she at that point she would have chosen a truck or a blue toy or blue clothes. He never really was into playing with girls or dolls, and his friends were always Voice. I really started realizing there was something wrong when I started to feel societal expectations of being a female. And that made me very uncomfortable, the way people saw me and how I physically projected myself to the world. to be morbid but it's like complete utter disgust with yourself and your body and you get anxiety like from other people seeing you a certain way and I was like you know what like I, I can't do this anymore I cannot talk about it anymore um, I need to tell someone and uh, he just basically told me that mom I truly believe I am transgender and at that time I don't think I understood what that actually means and she admitted she was like I really don't know what you're saying but you're my child and like I love you no matter what. Can anyone succeed like uh, performance level bodybuilding without a trainer? Yeah. He's been very open to us because we've been always open to him and we supported him in any circumstances. Therefore, he's had no fear to talk to us. Other parents out there who are going through the similar situation, we highly advise them to continue loving and supporting their children no matter what, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just trying to manifest themselves as they feel they are inside. After my surgery, I kind of just looked at myself in the mirror very objectively. I was like, you're very, very skinny. I look very weak and like, I don't want to look weak. I just wanted to be a little more fit and be more comfortable with myself, but for me, I've always had the personality like all or nothing. So like when I get it, when I get into something, I really get into it. I've done the hard work that's been done. It's just relaxing, practice posing and uh, you know, the show, and that's it. I mean, this has been a crazy experience. 
Uh, this is my mom. Say hi. Hi. It felt so amazing to get on stage and pose. Literally felt like the universe was telling me like, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it was just so empowering. Alex, When the show host raised Alex's hand in the air, it was fantastic. I'm sure there's people that think I should not be able to compete with the other men, but quite frankly, it's not really up to them. It's up to the people that make the shows and they're very accepting. And I think the reason for it is because they understand where I come from. Most bodybuilders, especially the men, get into bodybuilding because of insecurity. They understand that I come from a place that I'm just trying to better my body, better my mind, and they respect that and they encourage that. It doesn't matter if I'm trans or not. <sighs> I have people uh, DM me all the time um, saying that, you know, like, I didn't think I could look this way but like seeing you has really made me realize I can. And for me, like that literally makes me so emotional because I remember coming from a place where my biggest insecurity when I first transitioned was, that's great, I can transition, I can call myself a guy, but I will never ever look the way I want to look. If I could help like one or two people just feel better about themselves, that like makes me feel like everything I'm doing is worth it. It's time for a little morning boost. We could use this one. A teddy bear lost during a family trip is back where he belongs after becoming a star on social media. So Teddy was found last month in Milwaukee's airport. Employees posted pictures of him on social mm -hmm. media, grabbing a cup of coffee, training to become a pilot. <laughs> anyway, lots of people enjoyed his adventures. Five days later, the Teddy's family spotted that missing bear. My wife was sitting there and a friend of hers shared it via Facebook. It was just a, a fun story and um, she was just on her phone and then she just jumped up and she said, L -l -l she couldn't even speak. <laughs> and uh, I looked at him like, that's his bear, <laughs> without even a doubt. Well, there's five-year-old Ezekiel Burnett. You know what happened was he actually tossed the teddy up into the air when they were getting ready to get on their flight. It got stuck in the rafters, ah. and their parents were like, we don't have time to get it. We got to catch the fight. We got to catch the fight. So they left. He was heartbroken, and look what happens oh, at the end. How it all they both out. look happy in that picture. <laughs> exactly. I love that. All right, a family that loves to hit the slopes together attached a microphone to their four-year-old, four-year-old snowboarder. The result was adorable. It was a, like a little motivational video. Check it out. This way, you slip. I won't fall. Maybe I will. That's okay. Have we all fall? Have you and I? Okay, I can't. Oh. Let's go down this big old hill. <laughs> okay, is that amazing? Totally calming himself down, having a lot of fun. That's a little Auburn sage, fell a couple of times, but what a great attitude she has. Look, this oh, way. I love her. I won't fall. Maybe I will. I won't fall. Maybe, Maybe I, I will. will. Those are words to live yes, by. Yes, you know good what? girl. Just keep going. Yeah, that was awesome. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now.
let's get a morning boost. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so a woman in Florida gave her grandfather a little gift, and that little gift had with it a big secret. So he unwrapped it, and then it took him a second to realize what it all meant. Take a look. <laughs> what? You put the great in grandpa. Kaylee. Okay, great. Are you going to be a great. What? <laughs> Oh, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know, deal with that mess. Oh, my God. Oh, beautiful. Okay, the mug did read you put the great in Grandpa, so mm. he didn't quite connect it. But I love he was just like hugging her with for a mug, yeah, and now nice. he's like, yeah. He's like, anyway. that's great, honey. What? <laughs> Maybe that. do an August back. Hey, guys, welcome to the Hoda Show. I was thinking about originals and how cool they are. I interviewed this lady, you guys, the other day, and she was a percussionist and a composer, like world renowned. She also happens to be deaf. And when she was young, she had like hearing aids when she was 12 and they were distorting the music. So she took the hearing aids out and because her, her doctor said, you know, maybe you should take those out. You might, you know, it might be better for you. And her music teacher told her to put her hands on the side of like the wall or the drum when she was playing the drums and feel the vibrations so she could feel the music. She is a composer and has composed tons of music. And every single piece of music she she's come up with has come from inside her. You know how people get inspiration from this one and this one and this one, and then they put it together and say, this is me. But it's really a combination of everybody. And that's cool. But it so turned me on to know that everything this woman has ever created came from inside. It's like, imagine if you're just sitting in a dark room and people say, be creative. Everything you come up with cannot come from inspiration from outside. It has to come from inside. And it reminded me also a little bit about Dolly Parton, because I remember her saying when she was young and she was growing up in, I think it was East Tennessee, and she said that the only musical influences to her were her family, because they would just sing. They just sang together. And it wasn't like they heard somebody on the radio or they heard this one or this one told. So nobody told young Dolly Parton when she was younger, sing more like that person because they're selling a lot. Sing, you know what? If you were a little more like that, she's top of the charts. Oh boy, if you did this, I bet you, you would be X. Look at her success. So instead, Dolly just learned from inside. And so when she went to become a singing star, she was herself. She sang like herself. And she was a unique, and she's a, she is an individual. She's unique and she's an original. And isn't that cool? Like the coolest people aren't trying to morph into somebody else. I'm all for inspiration. I believe that it's important because that's how, you know, life goes. But for the people who just find it from deep inside, isn't it a wow? Like, wow. That's what I keep thinking. Like, wow, that is the coolest thing to have it come from like deep in your heart and deep in your soul. And that's you with nobody telling you to, like if you've ever been in any, almost any industry, cut your hair like this or sound more like that or be more like her. Look how good she's doing. Look how well she is doing. Or in a relationship, you kind of, you know, turn yourself into a pretzel to fit in. Be more like that so it works here all these things, you know, and it's like, all you really want to do is be you, right? That's the way you were created to be you an original and not an imitation of that one and this one and that one. You know, someone said like, what a waste it is not to be you, <laughs> you know, all these beautiful God given things are suddenly, you know, you're not using them. You're trying to contort them into somebody else. So for Dolly Parton and to that beautiful percussionist and composer who, is amazing, who really moved me to my soul. Um, thank you. I love when I get introduced to people like that. There are lots of originals out there. I feel like Kristen Bell's an original. Yay. Hi, Kristen. How are you? We were just talking about people who are originals, who don't, you know, I feel like you live your life. You do you. And I, I tell me if I'm wrong or right. I was just talking about how I, when I sit with Dolly Parton and I heard her tell the story about how she learned to sing. And she learned in the hills of Tennessee and just sang the way she sang. Nobody said, sing more like that. If you sang like that, you'd sell records. She just didn't know. And when she went to Nashville and sang, she was an original. That's Dolly. 
you know, no one, and she wasn't conforming to be like anybody. And I feel like every time I've interviewed you, I feel like you just go to the beat of your own drum. Am I right? I, I take that as a, a very high compliment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I think that, I think that um, it's too fatiguing to do anything else. Yeah, that's good. You know, the, you can get such a comparison hangover when you're trying to emulate someone else. And not only that, but you you A, you'll never be able to emulate someone else to perfection and B, you're going to lose what makes you unique. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has their own uniqueness. I think for a while I probably did. I wanted yeah. to be in the cool indie and you know, all these other things that girls in sort of my category and my business and industry were doing. And then at a certain point, I just realized I have a thing. It's quirkier than most and just lean into it. Like it's, it's almost like a stay in your lane. Mm. kind of thing. Like, I don't mm. need to be anything else. I just need to do what I do. And I had like, there was this huge moment of relief when I oh. decided to just stay in my lane. Was it, was it a, like, how does that moment come? That's what I'm curious about. Like, did something happen or did you just kind of decide over time? No, I think what happened was I was, you know, this was probably 12 years ago and I was attempting to do everything that uh, all the other actresses that were succeeding in my category were doing. And I loved when they got parts and I was trying to be happy, but I secretly wanted to be involved. And my husband said, why do you keep trying to audition for all of these dark indies? That's not you. Mm. Stay in your lane. Mm. Like you have something that other people don't have, which is the ability to, um, I don't know, make things lighter or be yeah. a little weirder or quirkier. Like start focusing on your choices and not trying to fit into anyone's box. And it was when he said, stay in your lane that I realized yeah, maybe maybe the people that I actually admire were the ones that, that that decided to drive down their lane and their lane only, like you're saying about Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. and weren't mm -hmm. looking around the whole time. Yeah, and that, did it feel like did it feel like riding a wave? Like sometimes you feel like you're swimming upstream. You're like, I can do this. I can be them, you know. And then all of a sudden yeah. you go, oh, okay, this is much better. Yeah, and it's like it. it it creates this nervousness initially because well, what if what I want to do is not something that anyone's ever done before? Mm. Um, like even in your line of work, I'm mm -hmm. sure you're like, well, maybe I want to be lighthearted here and hard hitting some mm -hmm. other places. Those aren't supposed to mix. Mm -hmm. but there's no, the thing is, as you grow up, I think I realized though, there are no rules. Yes. There are just no rules. You can do what you want to do if it's authentic. And it's a huge weight off my shoulders not to try to fit into the category of someone else and to just instinctually sign on to projects when I want to. And then somehow I've created a thing that is my lane. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Oh my gosh, the new Netflix show is called The Woman in the House Across the Street from the Girl in the Window. It is out now on Netflix. I mean, this is so, talk about stay in your lane. 
this is in your lane. I mean, it's filled with all the things you love, isn't it? It's got the Dateline stuff. It's got the weird, dark humor and the weirdness. Tell us about this show for people who haven't seen it yet. It is one of my favorite things I've ever done. And I know I sound like a broken record because I say that every time I do something, but I like the, I don't know. I like being a part of things that I, that I think have thread the needle so specifically, uh, mm-hmm. these writers, Rachel, Hugh, and Larry came from the Groundlings. Uh, they created mm-hmm. that show, Nobodies. I loved and respected them. They pitched me this show. They said, it's about time we make fun of the genre. So it'll be a mm-hmm. satirical, psychological thriller. So everything will be played straight, but we will absolutely be poking fun at every mm-hmm. single cliche in these movies. Uh-huh. And, you know, back in the 80s, they were a little bit more tongue in cheek, these psychological thrillers, Mm -hmm. crazier things happen. And then they've gotten very serious. They've taken themselves very serious lately. And, you know, Rachel especially just thought it was maybe about time we poked a little fun at it. So it is it's a darkly comedic thriller, (laughs) but it's heavy on building suspense while increasing in absurdity. So it's going to take you on a ride. And and my favorite thing is the people who don't get it and are like, this is weird. The dialogue is bad. And I'm like, yeah, that's the joke. That's the joke. It's the whole thing makes me happy. And I'm really, I'm thrilled with the whole thing. But it is hard to figure out. I mean, this isn't one of those layups when you start watching it, is it? Well, no, because when if you're going to do a broad comedy, yeah. everything is going to be a joke. Then you're going to struggle. Audiences disconnect if there's not a reason to see mm-hmm, the outcome. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. If the whole point is just to laugh for two hours. You might, you know, just turn it off because you don't care if yeah. you end up falling in love or they solve the whodunit. Right. You just don't care. So we had to make sure that both were very, very important. So the whodunit is definitely in the driver's seat but around every corner we are poking fun at how much wine she's mm-hmm. drinking mm-hmm. he is the obligatory line of i know what i saw <laughs> and you know like these characters in these psychological thrillers particularly the ones written um by women for women they tend to the women have this like secret ego mm-hmm. like my character's very self-absorbed and she keeps talking about how she was a beautiful art she used to be the greatest artist and then we show her paintings and they're so entirely average (laughs) and like that's the that's the joke she's talking so much about how will she ever paint again will she ever do the world her talents again and they're just like what you'd Uh. see the marriott or something (laughs) you know um, but every every single thing is a joke underneath a joke underneath a joke, mm. and we had a great time making it. So does the love of this genre, Dateline and whatnot, does this date back to when you were a kid? Did you read mysteries? Like, were you oh, always into that? What? Girl, let me tell you, I still have what? my Christopher Pike books. Oh, Do no. you remember Christopher Yes. Pike? I have them on a bookshelf, like my eight ones that I was allowed to buy, where they were all like, you know, who didn't come home from prom or whatever the titles were. Um, And then my mom has a really dark sense of humor. So we watched X-Files and I was young when that was happening. And we watched all the Datelines. I still can't find a Dateline that I that I haven't seen. I remember one X-Files with my mom. It was a one that we called liver man and somehow he like went through the grates of the um air conditioner and he came out like in smoke form and then he sucked your liver out like that was the that was the plot how old were you when you were watching those 11 oh no maybe 15 i don't know oh. young adolescent adolescent so i remember one time my mom had gotten up to go to the restroom and then um, I sat on the couch and then a couple minutes later I got up and she had been waiting underneath the dining room table. Oh God. And as I walked by the dining room table, she reached out and grabbed my leg and said, oh my God. And I, I've truly almost peed my pants. I mean, Are I you truly- not scarred? Come on. No, I love bit. that stuff. No, That's- I love it. I love it. It's fun. <sighs> I like laughing at myself and at things, and especially when I get scared. I also like scary stuff. I like horror movies. I yeah. like events. I like all of oh, it. Your, your mom sounds really cool, and you sound like a really cool mom. Uh, don't forget, guys, check out Kristen Bell's Netflix show. It's called The Woman in the House Across the Street from the Girl in the Window. The title mom. says it all. Uh, we the title says it second. all. <laughs> Kristen, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thanks for all the, all the, I took a lot of notes, so I learned stuff too. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we got Valerie Bertinelli. Stick around, guys. We'll be back on the Hoda Show. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. What a delight Kristen Bell is, isn't she? I mean, a true original. Like she, I loved the advice that her husband, Dak Shepard, gave her. And she was always trying to fit into another person's shoes in her professional career. You know, she said that she liked the indie, dark kind of, she always kind of admired those actresses. So she was always trying to take those roles when really what came naturally to her is being kind of quirky and funny. And sometimes you shy away from that, like you want the opposite of that. You know, I knew a great funny writer who all he wanted to do was write serious stuff because it, he felt like that was the itch he couldn't scratch. But in reality, funny was where his, that was his lane. And sometimes I think because if your lane comes too easy, you feel like it's not really yours. Like it, oh, that, I do that without thinking. That can't be what I'm supposed to be doing. But maybe that's the answer. Like that actually is what you're supposed to be doing. The thing that you're meant to be doing, the thing that comes easy, the thing that feels like breathing, the thing that feels like my heart can rest, I'm home, like that feeling. And I think once you find that, that's probably, you're probably on the right road, like where you're supposed to be. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who I uh, get the opportunity to interview and only a couple who I'm madly in love with. And one of them is Valerie Bertinelli. She is in her wine cellar, which is a <laughs> perfect place, because why not? <laughs> Valerie's got a beautiful new book out. It's become a number one New York Times bestseller. Of course it has, because she's somebody who everyone has been able to connect with in some way. And Valerie has a piece of all of us in her. So I think when we look at her, we see ourselves and we feel like, yeah, okay. She's got this, I've got this. It's called Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way That I Am Today. Valerie, um, a number one New York Times bestseller. I don't know if that ever gets old. Does it? <laughs> like, what was it like? Oh, heck that? no. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I was blown away when I heard. Um, it, it gives me so much joy because it, it, I feel like it's really gonna connect with more people, which is what I really want to what I really want from this book. I want people to um, see themselves in it. I, I want them to uh, express for themselves that I am enough already oh. and oh. enough already with the negative self-talk. I think it's it's so important to put ourselves on a um, on a better path. I mean, it's so easy to look at the negative. It's so, so easy. Mm -hmm. But it's a little more challenging to just like focus in on the positive when things can feel overwhelming. So what do you do? Because I am enough. Saying that you're enough, like that is a huge statement. And everybody has the little dark side right here on their shoulder that says, no, you're not. No, mm -hmm. you're not. You know who you are. And I know who you are. And you can actually almost hear it. It's like, oh yeah. how, how do you take that? that part of you because it's a part of all of us and and like cast it aside and remember that you are enough 
because they're a liar. That little voice is a liar. <laughs> and we're lied to a lot in our life. Um, and it starts at a very young age for a lot of us. Um, I, I can only speak for myself in that I was told the lie that I am unlovable when I gain weight. Hmm. And that is simply not true. How does your weight make you lovable or not? Well, it hmm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. And to believe that and have it so ingrained in my system and trying mm -hmm. to pull that out, it's, it is a challenge to say, I'm enough. But mm -hmm. boy, is it powerful when you mm -hmm. can really start to believe it. I don't believe it every day. Yeah. I am doing my best to believe it every day, but it gets easier. Maybe it's my age that it just mm -hmm. gets easier. Um, but I, I see so many people so much younger than me that they're really starting to get it, mm -hmm. that I'm enough, that you can't, you can't treat me this badly because I don't treat myself this badly. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a level of what we're willing to put up with because we've been so not good to ourselves. So we're willing to put up with that from other people. Well, the more, the better we treat ourselves, the better people will treat us. Anyone who has, you know, people reading your book are learning about you and they're also learning about loss and how you've been coping with loss, with the loss of your uh, former husband, Eddie Van Halen. But when milestones happen after the mm. fact, I was thinking mm. about that because he, he just, his birthday had just mm -hmm. passed. Like, how do you, how do you treat a day like that? Um, I don't know why it was so hard this time than the first time that he wasn't here for me to text him or say happy birthday. Um, I'm, I found myself being very aware of how I was going to, um, express it. And the picture that I posted, I went back and forth about like, should I do this? People are going to think, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. there were so many pictures I was going to post. And I started overthinking it and started thinking about what people would say. Mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are we here again, Val? Really? <laughs> are you going to care what someone else says about how you're going to express how you feel about someone? Um, so I just posted the picture and I said, I, just, I don't know. Um, it, I want to say it gets easier. It just, it sort of gets more complicated. Mm. It, um, I saw a lot of uh, signs from him that day. Mm-hmm that I chose to believe that they were signs from him. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it put me at peace. I just, my heart just, just was with Wolfie. And mm -hmm. I waited till very end, the very end of the day to call him because I know he was feeling overwhelmed with all of the stuff online. I think he probably stayed away from most of it, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, he was okay. He, he, he mouthed off a little bit about a few things that bothered him. And I was glad to be that board to mm -hmm. hear it for him. Um, but I, I worry more about him and, and him not having a dad to um, enjoy in all of his success. Mm -hmm. Someone who was the most proud of him. If anybody could be prouder of Wolfie, it was Ed than me. Mm. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I think that's funny also what you were touching on, like what to post and how to react to how people are reacting to you, mm -hmm. you know, and all of those things. And it's that line of like, um, am I going to worry about how I'm feeling or am I going to worry about what people think about how I'm feeling? You know, right. it's such a tricky, weird thing to even consider, even as you're sitting at a keyboard to just put a sentiment out there. So mm -hmm. um, I know you're very protective of Wolfie online too. You're like, uh, back off Barbie, I'll come at you. And you should. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> One of the many things I love about you, but how do you protect your own heart and or do you care about what they're saying about you? Like, I care less and less. I yeah. also happen to be very incredibly lucky that I get a way more kindness sent to yeah. toward me yeah. than not. And I, I appreciate that more than anything. I, I, I take that in. And when the, 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 the few do that come up, it's like that block button is really easy to push now. Yeah. So I just do that. I don't yeah. need, I don't need that in my life. You're, right. I mean, wouldn't it be like, great if we could just have a block button in our head as well? Ah, yes. Don't let that block. Yeah, yes. So I, let's do it. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? 
How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. So when people pick up the book and people are picking it up in droves, um, and I'm so are grateful. they, is that amazing? I mean, I just want to sit with crazy. that for a second. But it just, it just shows like what you have put out into the world. You have everybody saying the words like, wow, me too. Like, that's how I feel. Yeah. I know what that feels like. And you, you want to give hope. What are you like, what will someone take away? If we read through the pages, I might see myself reflected. Mm -hmm. But what do you hope, what are you hopeful that they'll learn? Because you learn so many lessons from all these different people who you've, who've helped you along the way, Angie and lots others. Mm -hmm. What, like what you. concrete things, well, but what concrete things do you think people would be able to take from what happened? Uh, from just the, the, the story, I mean, just something as simple as my relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. Those are such complicated relationships. And I, uh, I, 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 the first thing that comes mm -hmm. to mind is my regret for not mm -hmm. having opened up more to her, or let her open up to me if mm -hmm. she could, mm -hmm. um, so that we could have been closer when we were as close as you can be, I guess, for the trauma that my mom went through her whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, but regrets, I, I hope that people take away from this, that if, when you treat another human being mm -hmm. as if you're never going to see them again, mm -hmm. and, and you are the kindest you can be, mm -hmm. that feels so much better. Mm -hmm. And you're never, ever regretful of being kind to someone. Mm -hmm. You know, you're always regretful of, oh, I shouldn't have mouthed off. I yeah, shouldn't have done this. I wish I, I hadn't done that. Yeah. But there's never a regret about letting someone know how, how deeply you've affected them and how much you love them. You know, people struggle with what to share and how vulnerable to be. And how mm -hmm. do you how do you share but but also have some self-protection, you know? And mm -hmm. that's a fine line, especially, I mean, you, you can be an open book. I know there's many parts of you that nobody's, <laughs> nobody's going to know, you know, no. mm -mm. but, but how do you decide mm -hmm. what is, what is okay to share and what you're going to just keep for you and your family? Um, I don't know that there's ever a decision made. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I just verbal vomit out and yeah. it's like, oh, well, um, yeah, that's how I feel, I guess. Yeah. And I guess that I'm okay with that being out there. I, I love Brene Brown yeah. and uh, um, her idea about vulnerability and how that sets you in power mm -hmm. and peace. Mm -hmm. And I do believe the more vulnerable we are, the more powerful we become mm -hmm. in our own lives and mm -hmm. in how we can impact others mm -hmm. and to, to see how vulnerability is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's not a weakness. And I think yes. we need to teach that to a lot more of our men. Yeah, I think you're right. How is Wolfie, by the way? He's great. His music's going well. We're cheering him on, man. It's so fun oh to God, watch he's it. been nominated for a Grammy. I mean, Did you it's die? just insane. What? Is that crazy? I was, I was like, what? Honey, people don't get nominated with their first record a lot. This is a very rare thing. And, uh, and what for me, it's for best rock song. So it's for songwriting. And from the moment I started hearing all these things, I was like, dear God, you're a songwriter. Do you know how hard that is? Goes, yeah, I wrote him. I know how hard it is. He's so cool. But that's the hardest part. I'm so oh. proud of him. Well, there's nothing. I mean, the only, I, I just, when you talk about Wolfie, it's like, <laughs> it may be one of my favorite things that you do. Val, I want to say thank you. I want everyone to pick up this book. Uh, let's keep it where it belongs on top of the New York Times bestseller list and pick it up. It's called Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way I Am Today. It's chock full of lessons. If you're feeling a little down and out, pick it up. You'll be like, oh, oh I'm not alone. Okay, cool. No. I can do this. Yeah.
<laughs> Valerie, I love you. Thank you so much. Love you too, Hoda. Uh, we'll see Thank you soon, you. okay? You got I it. I hope so. Tuning in to a Tuesday Pop Start Plus today on the show, one of the stars of a mini series that has a lot of people talking, Inventing Anna's Anna Klumski is here to tell us why she thinks the story about a real life con woman is so captivating to viewers. Plus, Bob Odenkirk on the ups and downs of his career in an exclusive conversation on his brand new memoir. And a clip from the vault featuring Oscar winner Javier Bardem. But first, here's today's Pop Start. Lots to get to in pop star today. Savannah, is it Rami and Michelle's wedding? Or <laughs> Rami. Rami. Well, I might butcher this one too. First up, Fantastic Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Break out your wands, everybody. On Monday, Warner Brothers dropped a new trailer for the third chapter in the Harry Potter prequel series. The new preview teasing fans with a big return to Hogwarts as Jude Law steps back into the role of young Dumbledore and prepares to face off with one of the Wizarding World's most infamous villains. I'm sorry to disturb you, Albus, but I've just received troubling news. Tell me, what is it? It's Grindelwald. The time is closed, my brothers and sisters. Our war with the Muggles begins today! The world as we know it is coming undone. If we're to defeat him, you'll have to trust me. All right, Fantastic Beast, this Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore, hits theaters April 15th. Oh, thank God that's done. Next up, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock Never Fails to Tug at Our Heartstrings with this thoughtful post on social media and a new video. He's sharing a special moment from a visit to his grandparents' gravesite with his mom in Hawaii. Mommy and Daddy, this is for you. And for all of you out there who's lost someone, this is for you. Oh, that's nice of you, huh? Go for a walk. Tell it all, tell it means too much talk. I love for you to buy means I love you. Take it easy means file and move. Johnson adding in the caption, life moves so fast, mm -hmm. how important it is to just slow down, sit here, reminisce, and listen to her sing, play her ukulele, and tell all her stories. Some wise words from The Rock there. Sweet. Next up, Michael Douglas, the Oscar winning is Amy, winner, is aiming to catch lightning in a bottle with his next big role. Douglas set to star as Benjamin Franklin in a new oh. show that's headed to Apple TV+. Plus. The limited series is going to be set in the later years of Franklin's career, around the time he engineered America's alliance with France and peace with England. That'd be between 1778 and 1783, <laughs> if my Thanks memory recalls. Well is it Romy or Rami? Yeah, it's weird Romy, the things you remember. Yeah. Douglas will also produce the project based on Stacey Schiff's book, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. No word yet on when that show's scheduled premiere, but it does look good already. Mm -hmm. All right, finally, the first day of the month can only mean what? one thing. That's Jenna Bush Hager is here with a new book. Yes, yes I go. am. I'm so happy to be a correspondent on Pop Star. Let's do it. Are y'all ready? Yes. yes. We have a countdown, I think. Are we counting down on the plaza? I hope so. Three, if not, three, three two, two, one. one. It is Groundskeeping by Lee Oh, thank Cole. God it's that one. It is there a they beautiful, are. beautiful novel about an inspiring writer who takes classes at a local Whoa. college and becomes the groundskeeper. He falls oh. madly in love with a girl named Alma who is very different. It takes place in 2016, oh. but it's about family, unconditional love, and what binds us. Y'all, mm -hmm. in a time where everybody's so divided, yeah. we need this but book. Groundskeeping. Yeah. Okay. You can head to today.com yes. slash read with Jenna or use that QR code for more information. Join the book club. There's not only a book club, it's a whole conversation.
conversation, then you can buy the book or mm -hmm. be like me and wait till the movie comes out. <laughs> Do that, yeah. but you know what else you can do? You can what? join us tomorrow live on our plaza. We're going to celebrate the third can anniversary. Three, three oh. years. I've turned three. Oh of my read gosh. With Jenna, I know also, because oh. there's 35 books I still got to read for the past three years of to read with Jen. We have Nancy a lot. Know, yes, yes, and and also, it may be Nancy's favorite day. It's Read Across America Day. Yes. So we're going to have a really cool oh. story. Oh, Way to go, Jenna. Way to go. And now the reason we call the show Pop Star Plus, a few more headlines for you, and we'll start with Euphoria. The Zendaya-led series is making its way into HBO history. Sunday's season two finale was the network's second most watched show since 2004. The grungy high school mega hit coming in second only to, that's right, the mega hit Game of Thrones. Of course, you can believe it, it's already been three years since Game of Thrones wrapped up that show's finale and it scored a whopping 19.3 million viewers. A good sign for the upcoming spinoff, House of the Dragon, which is scheduled to premiere later this year. Finally, America's Got Talent Extreme. In last night's episode of the AGT spinoff, a 90-year-old grandmother stunned judges when she came out to perform a fiery stunt with her 24-year-old grandson. Lillian held on tight to Hunter as the pair rode through, count them, five walls of fire. Well, there's the extreme part of AGT Extreme. No surprise, all three judges gave Lillian and Hunter a big yes. And that's going to do it for your Pop Star Plus headlines. But we got a lot more coming up. Anna Klumski is going to give us a glimpse into her new miniseries that a lot of people are talking about. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You might know Anna Klumski from her Emmy-nominated role on Veep or the beloved 90s movie My Girl. Well, lately she's starring in Inventing Anna, a new miniseries about Anna Delvey, a real-life heiress who stole money from New York elites. Klumski plays a journalist investigating Delvey's story, and she told us what she hopes viewers take away from the show. I think Anna Delvey I didn't know anything, and uh, and it was really fun when I like told younger people, like my brother or something, that uh, you know I'm going to do this show about this young woman who who conned a lot of people, and then you know my brother's like <gasps> Anna Delvey, like he was like so excited, and yeah, so I uh, I got to come to it this way. They might have a story. Her name is Anna Delvey or Anna Sorokin, no one's sure. She's either a rich German heiress or she's flat broke. The charges are insane. You know, Shonda was interested in a lot more than just adapting a salacious, you know, kind of rich people story, right? Like she was interested in so much more about, about how people treat each other, how people deal with each other. Who, who's privy to whose information? You know, um, why? What are the sanctions for? Are the sanctions correct? Uh, do they need to be adjusted? Um, you know, how, how far can you get into somebody's life without harm being done? You know, th 
all of these things. She is everything that is wrong with America right now. I am famous. I mean, I know why our telling of it captivates me, but I, it's it's honestly still a question I have of what about her actual story has has lasted this, you know, already. Like, it, it, it's got legs and people still care about it. And I think that's wonderful. Obviously, selfishly, I think it's wonderful. Um, but it is sort of surprising. But yeah, like, we're living the actual phenomenon of her gripping personality. You know, she definitely does remind you of those, of the types of people that, that do kind of just grip on, um, on the people that they meet and they just make them want to please them. And so I think that society is doing that <laughs> in a weird way. And I'm part of it. Millions of dollars. Hi, Anna. I just had some questions. I have a question. What are you wearing? You look poor. It's something I really I, I connected to with playing Vivian was that she just really, really loves her craft. She loves the craft of journalism the way that I love the craft of acting. I mean, I think on the very surface, she and I both are really, really fast mental processing. You know, like we're, we've just got a ton of information and we're, and it's all, it's all game. So Jessica is um, is one of our co-producers. So she's she's given our blessing all the way um, from the get-go. And I, like we you know we, we didn't have like lunches. You know we didn't do that sort of thing because I I actually was tasked with not matching. I'm not matching her. Some of our our cast members um, had that assignment to you know to be playing a real person that is is known and and um, and to match them and, and mine we were fictionalizing um, so we're very very inspired obviously we're the articles the article but because the article is the thing that we were keeping most closely matched that is sort of what I went with I went with all of the written word that I could I read all of Jessica's articles I read all of her notes um, she's she, she's a copious note taker and I and thank you <laughs> um, you know especially as we were discussing for, discussing for such a cerebral um, character it almost feels like the written word you're gonna you're you're gonna unlock a lot more through their voice um, uh, on the page, and um, and I just felt like it was that that was my way in. It, it was it was like a I don't know it was like a decoding um, the written word, and I loved that. It helped me with with all my choices. I think Anna Delvey, you know, is up to her, and uh, yeah, I think I think she's. I think she's impossible to know. Um, I've never met her personally, so I'm not going to really get into who she is, but you know, I, again, another question, how much can you ever know a person, right? Is, your, is the way you see green the way I see green? None of us are gonna know, like ever. <laughs> so yeah, um, Anna, you know, it's, it's, it's for her to know and it's for other people to, um, to determine how much it matters to them. I hope that people, it's like the slow burn that I always hope for after a show, you know? I, I really hope that, you know, as they walk around in their own lives, making their own choices, they they have another platform upon which to, to decide, um, you know, what they think is good and bad, what they think is right and wrong, what is okay with them about the way people treat other people. You know, I feel like we present so many great and important and relevant questions about today's, we use the word society so much, but it's true, um, you know, about today's society that I think that, you know, an audience member would be remiss uh, to not adopt some of those questions themselves. You know, so that's, that's I just hope that they, they come, you know, come out of it with, with, with some, some personal debate. It's good. It's good. We should mention you can catch Inventing Anna right now, streaming on Netflix. Next up, a visit with the great Bob Odenkirk. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. And we're back on Popstar Plus. Bob Odenkirk is unmistakable for his roles, of course, in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Now in the new memoir, Comedy, 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 Drama, he put pen to paper about his own career in showbiz. And he told us all about it today in Studio 1A. and comedian Bob Odenkirk is one of Hollywood's most beloved stars. He's a four-time Emmy nominee for his starring role in Better Call Saul and shined on the beloved Breaking Bad, and now he's sharing his story. It's a new memoir. Comedy, 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 drama. Bob, good morning, good morning. How are hey, you? Hey, I'm good. I'm just, happy you so you're, I'm just happy you're here in this chair. That's so nice of you to say. We were talking I, about how you had, you call it a heart incident. Well, I want to just speak about it properly. Yeah. Heart doctors tell me that what I had was a heart incident, not technically a heart attack, but I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> my, I was turning blue and not breathing, and my, uh, my heart was arrhythmic. And it needed to get back to a rhythm. Where I don't really understand how it works, but I just know that I wouldn't have survived if. Where uh, did it happen? And how I was in the studio shooting Better Call Saul, our final season. Yeah. Which is going to premiere on April 18th, mm -hmm. and it's going to be great if you're a Better Call Saul fan. Yeah. I can't wait for you to see this. But we were shooting a great scene, me and Ray Seahorn and Patrick Fabian and some other people. Yeah. And uh, we had gone off to our waiting area, yeah. and luckily I stayed in the area with the other actors, because if I'd gone to my trailer, I wouldn't be here right oh now. Oh my God. So I went down and they uh, set up the alarm and, and people came out, and uh, Rosa Estrada, our health officer, was a, a medic who served in the armed forces for a tour, and she came out and started CPR on me and saved my life. Did some people have epiphanies after something like that? I'm having a very slow epiphany, yeah. even right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the epiphany was simply that my life is pretty damn great. How great and I should that. appreciate it and the people around oh. me. Um, honestly, that's, you know, I think people do have epiphanies when they have a near-death experience. Um, and oftentimes it's, I have to change something, you know. And I think my epiphany is I have to appreciate what I have because hmm. it's really great and I've got great people around me and um, for some reason people are very <laughs> nice to me well, and, and were so nice on social media when I had this heart, well, heart attack. Well, Bob, um, this book is filled with all of that appreciation, but what you found I love is a lot of what you appreciate your life or maybe the things that didn't happen the way you mm -hmm. wanted them to. Yeah. You were talking about once where you were, you were, you were trying for that Steve Carell job at the office and you yeah. wrote, 
Um, one trick to surviving Hollywood's beat down is to keep making new things in spite of every no. Yeah. To somehow stay in touch with the joy that brought you to the game. It can be hard to do when you're, there's me and Chris Farley backstage, yeah. backstage in Second City. That's me and Robert Smigel, yeah. a great writer of sketches. And uh, my oh, my agent, Ari Emanuel, so, now uh, world beater, no. amazing guy. So how did and, you pick yourself up when there was a when there was a swing and a miss like that? You know, I always had a weird faith in this business that if you came to it with a fresh idea, that you you'd get a, a hearing, a chance. Mm. And it's really true. I mean, showbiz loves new faces and reinvented, you know, characters and faces. So I uh, I think it's just been a great business, and I just believed I, even in the hardest moments, the sense that I had something to offer if I just was patient and set to writing, which is how I started as a writer. Well, as a writer on SNL, you wrote one of the most famous sketches, uh, Living in a Van, Down by the River, the Chris Farley sketch. Motivational speaker, yeah. That was that was to die for. It's one of those that lives on yeah, and on and on. Um, just real It's one quick. of my favorite things I ever did in showbiz. Really? My daughter asked me once, What's your favorite thing you've done? And I said it was doing this sketch at Second City every night for us the summer that I was there. And I wrote it for Chris, and he wouldn't quit until he made every performer <laughs> laugh. You could see him making yeah, I see. Uh, one by one. They're Christine dropping. Applegate and David Spade laugh. He wouldn't yeah. quit. He yeah. would just keep doing the character right in your face until you broke up. Are you happy you made the turn to drama? Um, I didn't even realize it was happening, man. All of a sudden, I'm in this drama stuff, and people are liking it. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, you know, you dig deeper into a character, and I've had such wonderful writing mm -hmm. with uh, the writers of Breaking Bad and now Better Call Saul. I've been very blessed. You are such a nice guy, Bob. Oh, I'm so nice happy. I, I hope people read this book. It's called Comedy, 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 Drama. It's full of not just stories about the business, but also stories about your life. And I think yeah. a lot of people are going to enjoy them. And also, if you're starting out in the business and you're wondering, can I take a crack at this? Yeah. This book is definitely for you. You can find more of it at today.com. Love Bob Odenkirk. Mr. Show, one of my favorite shows to this day. Bob Odenkirk's new memoir is available now. And coming up, we're dedicating our From the Vault segment to Oscar winner Javier Bardem. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. NBC News, streaming free now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Javier Bardem earned another Oscar nomination this year, his fourth, if you're keeping track at home, this time for his portrayal of Ricky Ricardo in Being the Ricardos. Of course, he won the Academy Award for his performance as a psychopath assassin in No Country for Old Men. What a movie that was back in 2008. Well, he spoke to today about that part. Here is today's From the Vault.
The Coen brothers have a new thriller out. It is called No Country for Old Men, and it has taken home two Golden Globes. The movie is set in 1980s West Texas. It's the chilling tale of three lives that intersect. When one makes a life-changing discovery worth millions, another hunts him down to get it back, and the third tries to set it all right. Academy Award-nominated actor Javier Bardem stars in No Country for Old Men. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, like a lot of the characters you run into in this movie, your character runs into, I was blown away. <laughs> Literally, by the movie, by the acting, by everything about it. By the way, congratulations on the Golden Globe, Thank Best you very Supporting much. Actor. I was sorry you didn't get to walk down the red carpet. Was that sort of a bummer? Um, uh, honestly, yeah, no, honestly, no, because you, really? you don't have to get dressed and do the carpet. You guys are in the sofa on the coach and having a drink and so relax. you're sitting in your underwear <laughs> watching it essentially well I don't I don't I don't know if I will be on my underwear but I <laughs> definitely was watching it on TV yeah well so many people <laughs> thought you would get that nod so were you surprised or just uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised about everything I, I have to say since the very first moment I did the movie having in mind that I'm a Spanish actor doing a movie with the Coen brothers that's quite a surprise so Everything beyond that is kind of a gift for me. I think it's extraordinary the impact that the movie you No know, Country for All Men has had in people, has in people, why and will have in people. Why do you think it's had that impact? I don't know, I think it's about the coins, about their work, about their talent, about how they are able to put together such a big masterpiece of a book by Cormac McCarthy and, and put it out there in a very uh, beautifully constructed way but also easy easy to for everybody but at the same time profound in in the way that uh, there's a big statement behind the movie that makes the movie more powerful is uh, is beyond entertainment it's something that is it has its own weight. You know, you talk about the effort of the Coen brothers, but you yourself, you had to create this character, Chigurh, and you had little to go on. Mm -hmm. In the book, about all you know is that the guy has blue eyes, which mm -hmm. you don't I have, don't have and yet you create this this very menacing presence mm -hmm. with the gate and the toy crossing and obviously the killing. How do you even go about creating Chigurh? What, what was the process like for you? Um, I guess it's about really trying to bring what he represents, which is kind of the symbolic idea of violence, into a human behavior, which unfortunately we know, we are aware of that in a lot of behaviors out there. Uh, we, we are part of the violence and we have violence inside. Whatever we like it or not, we have to face it and we have to uh, really control it. Uh, he can't and that's the way you have to more or less understand where he's coming from, what he wants, and try to put it out there and create this character that is just that, a violent machine. But was it hard to inhabit that character? Because just to watch you mm -hmm. is difficult. I don't know, I, I don't think it was especially hard. Uh, it was very hard to wear that haircut, <laughs> but it's not very, really hard to be him just because it's just fiction. It's not something that you take with you when you get back to the hotel. Yeah, tell me about the haircut because a lot of thought went into that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good idea of the coins. They did it, they, that's, uh, it came from them, and I think it's very helpful because make the whole character totally insane because it goes so against what he represents, this beautiful um, Prince Valiant kind of haircut that uh, it's totally, I don't know, uh, opposite what, of what it should be. Now, after you play a role like this, do you want to just do a something light-hearted, mm -hmm. silly? Uh, well, yeah, maybe. I don't. Know. I don't think in that term. So I just think about what the quality of the role is, and if I mean, I mean, I don't want to kill anybody else in the next <laughs> I'm glad couple to hear of that. years <laughs> in movies. I mean, so, no, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank Congratulations. You. Good luck with the Oscar nomination. Something tells me we'll be hearing your name a lot more in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. And guess what? It just so happens to be Javier Bardem's birthday today. So, Javier, happy birthday to you out there. Another pop star plus in the books. Tomorrow we've got one of the stars of the Gilded Age. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played. Right. The unicorn. The unicorn. you got to have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie.
Better make this fast. Yeah. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cut. Cold Cut. Hi, buddy cow. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit <laughs> now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Hi, hi, hi. Happy Monday. You're watching Today All Day and hope you had a great weekend. We're thrilled you're with us. Yeah, we are. Uh, you're watching Today in 30. It's our digital show. It's got everything you need to say from, see from this morning's show. We do it in 30 minutes. So coming up, we've got a one-on-one -on -one live interview with a man at the center of many firestorms during the Trump presidency, former Attorney General William Barr. His first live interview since resigning, and he had a lot to say. All that plus, we've got two huge stars uh, coming to visit us in Studio 1A. We have Ryan Reynolds and we have Renee Zellweger. They both have new projects out. Ryan's a movie, Renee, a new series. It airs right here on NBC, and we have some fun conversations with them. So, should we? Yeah, let's do it. All right, it's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. On the eve of the release of his new book, One Damn Thing After Another, Attorney General Barr, good morning. It's good to have you here. Good morning, Savannah. Well, uh, I'll start with this. We got a three-page single-space letter from <laughs> President Trump about your book. This was in response to questions that NBC posed. I can't read the whole thing, but it, it, it's mostly personal insults. He called you slow and lethargic. He said you were so lazy and cowardly. He just never quite understood what was going on. He didn't want to stand up to the radical left Democrats because he thought the repercussions to him personally in the form of impeachment would be too severe. In other words, Bill Barr was a coward. All right, here's the guy you came out of private life to help, someone you stuck your neck out for. Do you have any reaction to that? It's, it's par for the course. I mean, uh, the president is a man who, when he's told something he doesn't want to hear, he immediately throws a tantrum and attacks the person personally. So I, I thought the letter was, was uh, uh, childish. You don't pull any punches in this book either. Your book really details the good, the bad, and the ugly of working for this president. And you conclude with um, a pretty damning indictment, so to speak. I'll read some of it. In the final months of his administration, Trump cared only about one thing, himself. Country and principle took second place. And you go on to say he has no concern with ideology or political principle. His motive is revenge, and it is entirely personal. Why was it important for you to tell that truth? Well, I, I was uh, pretty content with the administration up until the election. I general I supported his policies. He was always hard to, to work with and, and resistant to advice, but you could usually keep things on track. But after the election, he went off the rails. He wouldn't listen to anybody except a little coterie of, of sycophants who were telling him what he wanted to hear. And I think he did a lot of damage after the election, both with this idea that the election was stolen and also by him sort of 
rallying this group to on the Capitol Hill, where the clear purpose was to intimidate uh, the vice president and Congress. And before we go any further, for those who say, oh, here comes Bill Barr, this is a rehab tour. He's rehabilitating his image. It's a day late, a dollar short. It's revisionist history with a, a lawyerly flair, you say. Well, people who know me uh, know I don't really care what people think about me. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, I was persuaded to take the attorney general job, because I wasn't looking for anything. I don't, I, I don't have a future career. I'm retired. And uh, I felt I could just call him as I see him. And anyone who tries to satis win the approval of others is going to be compromised very quickly. Well, let's call it as you see it on election fraud. President Trump in this letter says you failed to investigate election fraud despite, quote, massive amounts of evidence. In point of fact, you did investigate once and for all. Did the president lose the election or was it stolen or rigged by massive fraud? Uh, well, stolen and rigged are two different things, but there, there was no uh, stealing of the election through fraud, which means, you know, that people who were not qualified to vote or didn't exist, their votes were counted or that good votes were subtracted. Uh, the votes reflected the decision of the people. You can talk all you want about, you know, the playing field and the gaming of the system. And there were some things that have to be looked into, like the Facebook payments. But that does not mean that the election was stolen or that those uh, votes were invalid. There simply was no evidence of that. Polls show most Republicans believe the big lie. Only 21 percent of Republicans believe Biden was legitimately elected. You have an opportunity to address them. You may have some credibility with them. How would you explain? How do you know this election was not stolen via fraud and that Trump lost it legitimately? Well, first, all the examples that were thrown up very early were, you know, vaporware. There was nothing to them. They were they were just false. Uh, for example, one that the president repeated recently, uh, saying that more people voted in Philadelphia than there were voters. Nonsense. It was nonsense. Second, no evidence has come out since then. But third, you, you look at the vote, the actual vote, and there's no mystery as to why he lost. He lost for the reason he was told for a whole year he was going to lose, which is he alienated independent and Republican voters in the suburbs. That's why he lost. Let me talk to you about something you write in your book. that uh, You say that you actually confronted the president on December 1st with this and told him point blank in no uncertain terms that you had looked at the fraud allegations and there was nothing to them. Can you tell me about that conversation? Yes, uh, I had. I, I felt I, I had to uh, address these claims, and after I looked into them and, and sort of got sure of the facts, I talked to the AP reporter, and he asked me about it, and I told him. And the president was livid and called me in uh, to the Oval Office, which I knew uh, he would do. And we met in this little dining room in the rear, and uh, I told him that uh, what he was saying was BS and uh, that there was no basis for it, and he was livid. And long story short, uh, I said, look, you're disappointed with me. I'm perfectly content to resign, and he said, accept it. So. Well, after that December 1st meeting, and when you told the president it was BS, you then went out with Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of mm -hmm. State, and you wrote in your book, I felt Trump had taken a dangerous turn since the election. It had always been difficult to keep him on track. You had to put up with endless complaining and exercise a superhuman level of patience, but it could be done. After the election, he was beyond restraint. Why didn't you speak out more forcefully? Right then and there, having told the president it's BS, why didn't you say more right then and there to the American people about it? Well, I, I, I did, as a member of the cabinet, uh, say that to the press. And that was invoked all the way across the country that I was taking that position. And then on the press conference on the 22nd of December, my last full day at the department, I held a press conference and I reiterated it. You said there's no evidence of widespread fraud. You didn't say, I think the president is dangerous. In fact, in your resignation letter, you wrote, I appreciate the opportunity to update you this afternoon on the department's review of voter fraud allegations. Now, here you know the claims are BS, your words, not mine. Why wouldn't you have said something? How do you write a letter like that that leaves the impression that there might be something there? Well, as you remember, there was basically an allegation du jour. I mean, it was like playing whack-a-mole. 
And, you know, there, 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 was, uh, there were questions being raised. Yeah, but does that letter really reflect the spirit of what you knew to be true? It's dangerous and it's BS. Well, I didn't say he was, I, I said he was acting in a dangerous way because he, what, you know, he was not listening to advice from his advisors. And in the past, you could keep things on track. And now I felt he was sort of off the rails. Yeah. And, and, and you write in this letter, this resignation letter, I am proud to have played a role in your many successes. You go on to say your record is all the more historic because you accomplished it in the face of relentless, implacable resistance. Even if you felt that way, this is somebody you told Mike Pompeo, he's dangerous. You say in your book you were worried about the peaceful transition of power. You even had national security concerns that you voice in your book. None of this is present in this resignation letter. Didn't the American people deserve to know what you knew? Well, I, you know, I think on December 14th, that's when the state certified the vote. And, in, and that's the day I tendered my resignation. I th the, re the election was over for all intents and purposes. The idea that something could be done later on January 6th was nonsense. And once the election was locked in on December 14th, I tendered my resignation. And, and uh, I knew Trump was you know, going to be leaving office. Let's talk about January 6th. You write that Trump orchestrated the mob. He was not ultimately successful in overturning the election. But do you believe that was his aim to intimidate and pressure Congress? Yeah, I, I think that the aim was to was to pressure Congress and to pressure the vice president. And I said that regardless of whether laws were broken, regardless of that, it was a shameful thing because one branch of government shouldn't be trying to use a, a mob to pressure another branch. You of government. said to the Chicago Tribune before the election, you know how liberals project all this BS about how the president is going to stay in office and seize power. They're projecting they're creating an incendiary situation. Did you underestimate the length that the president was willing? to go to yes you did well I was surprised yeah I mean I, I thought it was a, a farce because there was no substance to it there was no legal uh, support for it. In the few moments we have we cannot get into the yeah, Russia sure. investigation completely but let me ask you this you decided when Robert Mueller chose not to analyze the, the, whether there was criminality on obstruction. You decided, I'm attorney general, I'm going to make the decision. Now, why did you do that when the whole point of the special counsel was to take it out of the political chain of command and to remove either the conflict or appearance of conflict? And you acknowledge in the book you thought it was a phony scandal. So you, you took that decision upon yourself. Well, Why did you do that? Well, it is a phony scandal, and people, in talking about the big lie after the election, forget that there was a big lie, bef you know, at the beginning. Well, be that of the as Trump it may, I'm more focused on the issue of your attorney general. You believe it to be a phony scandal yeah, be before you even had any facts, and the special counsel is appointed to take it out of the political arm. He found the facts, and uh, he did it uh, as as a special counsel. Yeah. He used working for the attorney general, by the way, and he used the compulsory power, yeah. grand juries and so forth, to extract evidence. That is That process is permitted precisely to make a decision. Yeah, but here's the thing. You could have said, Mueller, I don't like your approach. You did this investigation. You make the decision. You could have ordered him to do that, couldn't you, instead of taking it upon yourself? He, he indicated he, he did not want to make that decision. But you could have said, it's better if I don't. I'm the attorney general. I've got, you know, it, I, I want to protect the Department of Justice and its reputation for impartiality. You could have told him, you make well, the decision. Well, you know, the, it, 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 that's another area where it's critical of Bob. I'm not sure it was that impartial. When you go back and look at the way it was handled, the reason he was selected by Rod Rosenstein was to uh, to give the appearance that there was no partisanship. And then he went out and hired a lot of partisan Democrats. And so half the country didn't have confidence in what was going on. After the, the Russia affair was over and the Mueller uh, testimony was complete, you write about getting together in your office, you said, we felt we had finally put Russia Gate behind us and behind the president. I brought out my tray of single malts and soon the sound of hearty <laughs> laughter and clinking glasses filled this, the air. It felt like a great weight had been taken off our shoulders. Now the president can focus on his positive agenda. Now, this does not sound like the independent attorney general you say that you were in this decision making. Well, that was that was in 
during the summer. It was in July after long Mueller after testimony. long after I made the decision yeah, just, when he was testifying. Yes, but do you see why somebody sees that? No, that sounds it was like a, a defense lawyer's party. Well, I don't think so. I think I think the department had worked very hard on this, and and uh, I had certainly taken a lot of guff about it. Uh, it was a lie. It was a lie which the media pushed. Uh, it was a feeding frenzy that hobbled the administration and was unfair to the president. And uh, I dealt with it accordingly. Finally, God, you say in your book it's time for the party to move on from Trump. Liz Cheney has said he is not fit to serve and should not be ever near the Oval Office again. Do you agree with that? Well, I certainly have made it clear I don't think he should be our nominee, and I'm going to, you know, support somebody else for the nomination. But if he is the nominee and you have your choice is Donald Trump or whoever's running on the Democratic side, would you vote for him? Uh, because I believe that the, the greatest threat to the country is the progressive agenda being pushed by the Democratic Party, it's inconceivable to me that I wouldn't vote for the Republican nominee. So even if he lied about the election and threatened democracy, as you write in your book. Well, it's, well, it's better hard, than a Democrat. It's hard to project what the facts are going to turn out to be three years hence. But as of now, it's hard for me to conceive that I wouldn't vote for the Republican nominee. All right. William Barr, always good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Once again, the book is called One Damn Thing After Another. It's out tomorrow. We're back after these messages. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free. Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. NBC News, streaming free, now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free. Now. with the one and only Ryan Reynolds. He's starring in a new sci-fi movie. It's called The Atom Project. He's playing a time-traveling pilot who teams up with his 12-year-old self. Take a look. Because you can't fight to save your life. Zip it! How do you know my dog's name? Because I named him. Where are you going? <laughs> Boom. It's so cute, oh. Ryan. Good morning. <laughs> oh, good morning. Gosh, oh, the, you know, good morning. You're here. You are. You're acting with your 12 year old self in yeah. this. I mean, what? I, it, the time traveling thing is intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you could, you can't pick now. If yeah. you could travel back to any time in your life, like, a, any, what era yeah. is like the best time. Ryan this Reynolds is era? Life. Yes. I don't, you know, I wouldn't mind, uh, I wouldn't mind going back and seeing my childhood home, which has oh. since been uh, bulldozed and uh, I think given an exorcism over the rubble. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing that. Were you, what were you like when you were a kid, by the way, when you were 12? What were you like? I was then? much more introverted than, than this amazing yeah. kid, Walker Scobell is. Yeah. He's much more of a representation of current me, but I was a much more introvert, introverted kid when I, was, when I was little. I love the concept of this movie. It's almost like if, if you could have a do-over in life, if you could go back, yeah. if you could go back. Well, there's like real spectacle driven yeah. wish fulfillment. Something I love about uh, 80s Amblin movies like E.T. Yeah. and mm. Back to the Future, yeah. or even Stand By Me, those kinds of movies that are like, you know, steeped in nostalgia for us. And this is the fourth movie that I've properly produced Deadpool 1 and 2, Free Guy, and now Adam Project. The, the latter two I was lucky enough to make with my friend Sean Levy. 
um, and you know, uh, both of which were engineered ex extreme to, to audience delight, mm -hmm. really, just to, to engineer for audience delight. I don't want to make movies that contribute to, to any of the weight people are already carrying mm. around the last, certainly the last few years. And, and these movies are, remind me of when I was a kid and I would watch these movies with my dad, like Back to the Future, and we would both think it's the coolest movie we've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. They don't bifurcate the audience. They really, they really hit both kids and adults equally, in equal measure. And my kids saw The Adam Project and absolutely flipped. Oh. I think The Adam Project and House of Gucci are their two favorite oh movies my God. <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I can't prove that they've yeah. seen and It House wasn't of Power Gucci. of the Dog? No, but they, they have been speaking in heavy Italian accents around the house for the last <laughs> couple of How weeks. How old are your kids? I've they're seven, up. five, and two. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> That's and our, our house just, you know, it has, there's a real air of revenge, <laughs> betrayal, decadence, and murder. So I know that they've seen that movie. They're like me. When I was a kid, I used to watch all the, the movies you weren't supposed to watch. You did? Like I what? keep coming home what? and I'm like, what, what why is this all? Yeah. What um, was the movie you watched that you knew you were not supposed to? Well, the first rated yeah. R movie I ever saw was Stand By Me. And I can't, oh. when you think that back, was an like, R? how is that rated R? Yeah. It was a rated R movie. Oh. So I was blown away. And then I saw Dune, which I know I shouldn't have seen, like at, at like five, yeah. which is just complete. <laughs> Where were your parents? They yeah, were what were nightmares. they doing? Absolute failures. <laughs> yes. Parents. This parenting fail 101. Is so what when did you, it's so interesting to yeah. me that you say you were introverted. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't see that about mm -hmm. you. When did you become extroverted. Oh, if you are, do you I mean, think? I don't think you are. I'm not as extroverted as one might guess. Uh, there's <laughs> you had some of that there. aviation gin this yes, morning, didn't exactly. you? Yes, yeah. exactly. It's uh, just a little nip in the coffee and we're, <laughs> we're good to go. I'll walk the kids to school. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I was introverted as a kid. I was the youngest of four boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just mayhem in our house. I was this little moving target running around. It wasn't, you know, so I had to kind of get by with my wit instead of my muscle. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was all an act. It was something I just sort of put on so I could, you know, stay alive. Well, I like. <laughs> well, I like that that has. Well, it hasn't completely gone away. I was reading or, or listening to where you talked about, even recently, when you used to step out on the set of David Letterman, mm. something would happen inside of you that I think happens to a lot of people. You yeah. get like freaked out. It's almost stage fright. Yeah, you just don't picture you having stage fright. Yeah, it's a sort of paralyzing yeah. in a way. And then it's sort of like when you hear them call you, your name and they, there's no way to avoid it. You're going yeah. out there. Yeah. And then it's just sort of like, for me at least, some, someone kind of takes over. Like this little guy in my brain just sort of takes over and runs the show and makes it all great and off we go. And it's, I'm not, a, so many people deal with this from, it's normal yeah. to experience this to a certain degree. And then sure. there's other, other versions of it that I've experienced that are probably not as normal and a little bit more of a struggle to get through, but uh, I'm not. I'm not complaining. I, I feel like it's. Uh, it's also, you know, on the other side of it is there's all like gifts with it as well. So. Yeah, you're such an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. we know, of course, about your movies and your acting. Mm -hmm. But you had the gin company, which I did just ask you about. Like, should yeah. I try that gin? And you. Said well, I think you will. I mean, it's a it's a real <laughs> vodka killer in the sense that it's. Re like, well, that's. I wondered if I was mm -hmm. wanted to open my my heart up mm -hmm. to your gin. Yeah, because it's not <laughs> super junipery, which some gins are. So oh. like, some gin can taste you're like Christmas fancy. in a cup. Oh, this yeah. one is like. A much okay. mellow, smooth, smoother, and that's why I uh -huh. fell in love with and it. And you so. do the marketing, Super Bowl oh, yeah. commercial. I mean, and you've oh, yeah. got that soccer team. Don't yeah, you have soccer team. What are you uh, doing? Why don't you just rest? Like, what are you? You're um, just working all the time. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I'm. I, look, listen. There's, be there's, a bigger I, loser. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I work with amazing people, so I'm able to kind of do more than I can bite off a little bit more than I can chew because there are several mouths chewing the meat. <laughs> but so, but you did take a pause from making movies because you did want to spend more time at home. How has yeah. that? Have you been able to feel that with oh, all of your other? Oh, it's been hell, Hoda. I'm going <laughs> right back to. It. I'm taking the first movie I can find. No, I, I, it's been great. It's been. I get, you know, I'm still busy as you can all as you can imagine. But yeah. I, I, I get to be there for my kids in the morning and at night. I get to put everyone to bed. It's just I love that. So um, I'm no less busy. I'm just home. Yeah. More. I loved how you described your house because yeah. isn't it funny to see we all we all have little kids yeah. that age. It's just like raw yeah. human nature. Yeah. Oh my God. Just it's. It's oh, unbridled. The hum the yes. humanity. Yes, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's ca morning routine is just so unpredictable. <laughs> I mean, I lay awake at night. There's anxiety. I lay awake and I think like, what's going to happen to me in the morning? <laughs> How's this going to go down? I'll get the coats on, the shoes on, yeah. out the door. Is, is one of the, are one of these children going to strike me? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, yeah. well, we adore you. We can't wait. You're going to come back on the fourth hour with me and Jenna to talk some more? I'm very excited about that. All right. We're also going to bring your young co-star, Ron Walker, who we He's think is phenomenal. Greatest. He's so He's great. Cool. All right. Again, The Adam Project is out this Friday on Netflix. Oh, that's a good one.
This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Legend in the house, Renee Zellweger. <laughs> Good morning. Come By the in. way, Ryan Reynolds was just on, and he was just saying, you know, I saw the clip on on your show. He was like, wait, is that Renee? Is that <laughs> Total Renee? transformation. I mean, we all had to. That was a real transformation. It took hours, huh? Uh, you know, um, just wearing a lot of people's jobs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I yeah, I really didn't do anything. I sat there, and uh, Arian, who's the genius magician who creates them, you know, he builds them from a, you know a mold and paints them right down to the freckle. Um, very talented people. Did it get you in the mood to play this character once you had? It's like when you put a costume on, and yeah. you sort of get in that place. Well, it's an excellent place yeah. to hide behind <laughs> two pounds of latex <laughs> and your head. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like to yeah. step into Pam? Yes. What is the thing about yes. Pam? For those who don't know, yes. mm -hmm. she's a real character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, an interesting an interesting person, I thought. Um, like millions of people, I listened to the podcast mm -hmm. and was just riveted. Um, it's fascinating because you just keep asking yourself how. How it's possible when there's this mountain of evidence yes. that people would just willfully look past. And, and how does that happen? I thought it would be a really interesting uh, thing to explore. Uh, so, yeah, we dug into that. And, and what was it about her, though? Because, mm -hmm. you know, so many people obviously believed her mm -hmm. when she was accusing the husband of murder. I mean, she was the kind of person you would believe. Mm -hmm. What was it inside of her that you had to tap into? Well, you know, what's interesting is that she doesn't really fit the, the prototype of mm -hmm. person that you would suspect of, of, of any wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. You know, she's friendly and she blends into the community. She looks like someone all of us know. Mm -hmm. She does the school pickup. You yeah. see her at, you know, church. So it, it's fascinating whenever, you know, I don't know, someone's behavior deviates um, so dramatically from what you might expect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was sort of what fascinated me about it. I feel like there was a time where you kind of took a break mm -hmm. from yeah. acting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that just me or did you? You did, <laughs> oh, yeah. right? Oh, I did. How, how, like that, we'll call it the interregnum, yeah. you know, like the period where you weren't, to come back now, mm -hmm. how do you think about it now? Like, how do you approach it? Does it feel better, feel worse? Do you feel more confident, mm -hmm. less confident? Like, how did, how did that period of time mm -hmm. shape you and, and how you are now? Oh, that's a really mm -hmm. good question. Um, I, you know, I don't know that I've reflected on it that much, but I do know that it's different. I needed to step away and kind of grow as a person, learn some things that were not really related to work. Hmm. Um, I mean, that's one of my favorite things about the work is that you have an opportunity to learn yeah. things that, you know, you wouldn't otherwise have occasion to explore. Um, went to school um, and just, uh, you know, just took some time out and decided, uh, you know, I wanted to maybe participate in a different way. Went to um, school, you said? What, what I things, did. What, what did you, yeah, what, what school did you go to? Oh, I, uh, I just, I snuck into UCLA for a little while and did some public policy. You did? Yeah. What did you study? What? I didn't know that. Do I we know either. this? This is no, so cool. This is cool. Yeah, uh, international law. Yeah. Just really oh. interested. 
Wow. Interested in politics. And yeah. Was fascinated bumping into Mr. Barr backstage yeah. this morning. That was the Today something. Show, you could run into the former Attorney General or yeah, Ryan Reynolds thought, or Renee yeah, Selweger. It's fascinating. I thought this is really weird. This is just. <laughs> is, it, is this toward an end goal or just something that you wanted to do kind of in the interim? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not oh. sure. Wow. But uh, it's it's one of my favorite things. I'll bore you to death at a dinner party. I really will. Just don't get me started. I'm I don't believe that's world possible. And, no, no, it's true. It is true. Ask any, any of my friends. Um, <laughs> Just just back to the show for one more second. Yep. Were you a Dateline fan? Were you someone who watched it? Yes, or? aren't you guys? Yes. yes. You're on she, the road, date, right? She used to be a Dateline. I used to be a Dateline. Oh, 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 we That's call her Dateline Hoda. Right? Yes. Oh, oh, look at her. Look at her. Oh, no, please oh, don't. Oh. That, you know what? That was unfair. No, <laughs> tell her the truth. She's going to get it out of you. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I knew this. And because, yeah, I do, we go back. We yes. go way go back, back. With, the, with the Dateline. Yeah. And how about how about the little Keith Morrison ad, too? Keith, oh, nice. isn't he is he's he the, the greatest. best? Yeah, oh. he really is. I, mean, I don't think there's anybody ever had the uh, had a better voice for, for true crime. I what know. Do you think? Wow. He's incredible. Well, he's a legend. I tried to get him to record my outgoing voice message <laughs> on my phone, and best then I blew idea. it and didn't press record. Best <laughs> idea ever. Renee, we're so happy. Happy. Thank yeah. you for coming to see us, no, and thanks for sharing. Yes. A reminder, please check this series out. We know it's a hit. It's called The Thing About Pam. It's tomorrow night on NBC, 10, 9 Central. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Well, we really hope you come back for another big morning right here on Today. We're gearing up for a really special event. Yeah, it's International Women's Day, and we're celebrating in a big way. So come back tomorrow. Join us. We'll see you then. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping vine of crab. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can't. You just have to try it. <laughs> You just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, 
you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see Ma you. Ma How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for an autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel, oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, 
mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's which honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> A lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> Just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up salty. Broken salty, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Jackson now weekdays at 5 on NBC News now this is a very different kind of program we're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world professor I'm not asking you to predict the future but what do we think that the new normal is going to be is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers what is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this it's not my job to tell you what to think my job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. 
Ali Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forge their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning, before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I was 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. Be one of the last Mohegans left. There's not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs. And it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall. But changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance no more black watermen. Really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught 
high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. So I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart, so uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling, and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, what crab blossom? Crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in DC, so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then, 
the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line, hundreds of people <laughs> on the block in and and that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm gonna grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. And what I know, I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Merlin jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just got to see if there's any shells. And if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce in particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough fowl? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's stay by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular? The recipe, the most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a 
a bar more favored and you know make it handheld and on on the go uh -huh. you know it's throwing your hand kind and, of and food. yeah exactly yeah. yeah so i think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular other than the taste as well right well, exactly. you know <laughs> yeah because you can take taste. it with you but if it's not right, tasty, right, probably exactly. not, uh, come back for it yeah so what we're going to um, do is uh we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh crab something like a, a quarter cup or so mm -hmm. we're going to sit in the middle Not too yep. much? Yeah, you want to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, you want to put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're going to literally fold them up envelope style. What, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, yeah. is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! I faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these yeah. bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! If you had to describe the heart of your cuisine, what is it and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my, my story. And I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and some crisps around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And, want to even fry. Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made. And this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet. It has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah. And I try the piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yes. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alf, you have done Baltimore Pride. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. Closing in, Russian forces edging nearer to Kiev and growing more brutal by the day, escalating deadly attacks on civilians across Ukraine. Just ahead, where the invasion stands and the number of refugees desperate to flee now in the millions. This morning, Lester Holt on the ground in Ukraine and the growing pressure on world leaders, including President Biden, to do more. Pain at the pump, that volatility overseas fueling a coast-to-coast -coast surge in gas prices, now topping $4 a gallon for the first time in nearly 15 years. Sticker shop? <laughs> Wonder what's next. An all-time record here in the U.S. expected to be shattered this week. Why the situation may only grow worse. Wild weather, deadly tornadoes rip through Iowa. Wildfires forcing thousands to evacuate in Florida. Just ahead, today's threat of even more severe storms and record warmth up and down the East Coast. 
center of the storm. Former Attorney General William Barr speaking out live for the first time about his volatile time in the Trump administration, the controversies under his watch at the Justice Department, and his dismantling of the president's lies about the 2020 election. Our live one-on-one -on -one interview straight ahead. All that, plus facing the future. Starting this morning, masks optional for millions of students, including those in the nation's largest school district. With COVID cases declining and mandates being lifted across the country, inside the move leading to both celebration and some concern. And riddle me this. Justice. The answer is justice. The Batman soaring to a nearly $130 million box office debut this weekend. Why the biggest opening of the year has Hollywood and movie fans smiling. Today, Monday, March 7th, 2022. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Oda Cuppy. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to you today. It is a Monday morning, 7 a.m. on the West Coast, and we're glad to have you with us. Yeah, we do have a lot of breaking news out of Ukraine this morning, including a Russian ceasefire offer to help evacuate desperate refugees. But Ukrainian leaders slamming that idea, saying it would lead its citizens straight into Russia or its ally, Belarus. In the meantime, Russian forces are gaining new territory this morning, pushing into areas north and northeast of Kiev. But many are being met by heavy resistance resistance from Ukraine forces, as well as civilians, some directly facing those oncoming troops. As for the economic impact beyond government sanctions, more companies suspending goods and services in Russia. Netflix, FedEx, TikTok joining a growing list of businesses pulling out. And all of this is happening as gas prices in the U.S. quickly approach an all-time high. Take a look. This morning's average is $4.07. That's up six cents in a single day, 46 cents in a week, and more than 60 cents in just the last month. We're covering it all from that pain at the pump to the humanitarian crisis and the U.S. troops now stationed closer to the conflict. We'll begin with NBC's Richard Engel in Kiev. Richard, good morning. Uh, good, ma good morning, Savannah. We are now at a situation where Russian forces have advanced to right to the edge of Kiev. We are now in the northwest corner of Kiev. And if you go down this road about uh, three miles, there is a bridge, a bridge that has been blown up. And just beyond the bridge is a small suburb called Irpin. Uh, it is a contested area right now. Russian troops and tanks have moved into Irpin. There is heavy fighting. And amid the heavy fighting, civilians are trying to evacuate, trying to come down this road. They are being assisted by Ukrainian forces. And they are heading deeper into the city, hoping that they can find find refuge among the buildings, among the population deep here in, in, in Kiev. But even as they leave, they're still being shot at. Russian troops this morning are on the doorstep of Kiev. So Ukrainians are escaping from the bombardment of the suburbs to go deeper into the heart of the city. And even though they're fleeing, Russian troops are firing on them. Ukrainians say at least four escaping civilians, including a family, were killed in this attack. Ukrainian troops and volunteers are helping civilians cross under a downed bridge, walking across the only slippery planks to safety. Russians have taken over this suburb, which is on the northern edge of Kiev. They are bombarding it heavily. The Ukrainians blew up this bridge in order to slow down the Russian advance, but it has also made it extremely difficult for people to evacuate these areas that are hotly contested as Russian forces try and consolidate their positions and the Ukrainians try to keep them on that side of the river. Those who make it across the river are in shock. I was bombed, this woman says. We were trying to escape and we were bombed while walking. But in areas Russia does now control, Ukrainians aren't submitting to their will, pouring into the streets, shouting down Russian occupiers, laying down in front of their vehicles. And in one case of extreme bravery and balance, riding on top of one, waving Ukrainian flag. The fighting spirit is proudly on display. We visited a soup kitchen, volunteers cooking donated food for 500 people a day. 
Not far away, closer to the front, two new Army recruits got married. A drone fitted to drop explosives dropped rose petals instead. And how are you feeling right now? Uh, I'm happy, but my heart is crying uh, because of the While down in the shelters where Ukrainians are spending long and lonely nights, a young girl put on a show, singing the theme from Frozen, and lifted worried souls. The Russians have proposed a humanitarian corridor of sorts to allow civilians to leave major cities, but the routes they're proposing would take evacuees to Russia or Belarus. That was quickly rejected out of hand by the Ukrainian government, saying, why would people possibly go to hostile territory? They said they're not even considering it. Savannah? Richard, it's just heartbreaking. Thank you very much. Unsure of what is to come as a precaution, the Pentagon has now deployed some 12,000 troops to NATO member nations near Ukraine. Josh Letterman is on the ground in Latvia with some of those American service members. Hey, Josh, good morning. Good morning, Hoda. These are the front lines of NATO's eastern flank. The 30 members of NATO have pledged to defend every inch of territory in the alliance. But if Putin succeeds in overtaking Ukraine, Baltic nations like Latvia fear that they could be next. This morning, American troops far from home, training in Latvia alongside NATO allies, the last frontier between Russia and the West. The battlefield scenarios these war games are simulating are entirely real. Brigadier General Joseph Hilbert oversees the 7th Army Training Command. What message do you think exercises like this send to our potential adversaries? I think they send that we're ready. And we are, we are again, a 30-member alliance um, that's based on common values of, of freedom. It's a little over 100 miles from here to the Russian border. When President Putin says that NATO's expansion into Eastern Europe 